Hey, this is Devon Dudley of the Dudley Boys, and you are listening right now to Interactive Radio. Oh, my brother, testify. You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. Hi, this is Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio. You're listening to KASC, The Blaze, 1260 AM. And it starts right now. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Wrestling Epicenter here on the Blaze, 1260 AM. It's your boy, Chuck D. Joining me, as always, is James Walsh. we got a lot to get to this week. we got Francine coming on here momentarily. We also want to talk a little bit about this Ultimate Warrior rant that's going on. we got our Raw recap. We have one of the original four horsemen, Mr. J.J. Dillon, joining us here this evening, as well as uh, Mr. Moody, who actually did a documentary entitled 101 Reasons Not to Be a Professional Wrestler. We're going to have him on the show as well. So we got a fully packed show as we always do but we're gonna try and motor through it off for us you know what i'm saying james yeah i know what you're saying dude it's another week and another dollar i guess you can say uh we're getting paid off this dude as far as i heard oh yeah yeah hey francine you with us how about you be getting where's my checks? money at guys uh, where's anyone's money at right now you know what Check I'm saying? Your I, I just heard you guys are getting paid for this i think i should uh be making a mint too, don't you think? Oh, we're all trying to make a mint. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm Check kidding. Check your PO box. <laughs> oh, really? Oh yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> we're good like that. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. How was your weekend, Francine? My weekend was absolutely hideous. Thank you very much. Hideous. I. It was hideous. I was sick up until about Tuesday with the worst sinus infection you can imagine. Ugh. It was, uh, believe me, it was awful. I was just a walking zombie, all liquored up on on cough medicine and elixirs, and oh, it was just so bad. And that wasn't fun at all. No, no, because it wasn't the it wasn't the kind that made you like um, kind of groggy or gave you like the you know the little buzz that you get off of <laughs> some of the cold medicines. This was just straight up. Um, you know, it 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 cleared me up within like four days, but it no buzz, no nothing. It was a horrible weekend. Well, that's no good to hear. No, it sucked. <laughs> but you know, once in a while, you gotta go through that kind of stuff. So I've had a question. Know, I feel better now. I got a question I've been meaning to ask you, Francine. I'm scared. Okay. Do you ever happen <laughs> to watch those VH1 reality shows ever? Like the um um like uh what what's the one I'm thinking of like the the real life or yeah i want to ask you about like that the bonaduce you one have you seen this at all i saw about five minutes of it and i turned it off and you turned it off he pissed me he pissed me off so bad um what did was, he say it was when he was um he, he said that he cheated on his wife yes. like I, I guess part of the whole show is him in therapy <laughs> this is like um, the biggest train wreck on tv it's the greatest oh, yeah. show out there is it really because i oh. got so mad because his wife is like you know I'll stick by and then blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry. If I get cheated on, I am out the door. I am, I, I, just believe me, he's he's a mess. He, he's, he's a mess. He's lucky he has a girl that even <laughs> looks at him because, ugh. Well, do you whatever. know what? They it doesn't got married sound like he, it the same like... day they met. What's I mean, that? I'm he, sorry? Him and his wife got married the first day that they met. She said that she wouldn't uh, sleep with him because she was a good Christian until they were married. So they were in Vegas and they got <laughs> married that day. <laughs> That's awesome. So then he could sleep with her. That's how the whole okay. story began of this craziness. Um, they've been together for like 14 years. they got two kids. And I guess on the next episode, this dude cuts his wrist because his wife threatens to leave him. Because he, he beat up a, one of her band members for cracking her back. And he's like, oh, that's the mother of my children. This can't be happening. This has got to be like the greatest show on TV right now. I'm serious. Anyone out there listening needs to watch this because it's like really watching a train wreck in slow motion. This Real, guy is okay, so messed up. Okay, I'll watch it then. I, you know, I just I get mad at infidelity. Like that really, really gets under my skin. Um, I I have no tolerance for cheaters or liars. Mm. So when I hear something like that, it's an automatic turn off, and you know, I just automatically turn the channel. But I mean, I'll I'll give it a try if you're saying it's that. Well, good. that's what I think makes it so good is because. Not only does he cheat on his wife, I mean, this guy drinks heavily. He does, I mean, this guy doesn't do anything right. He's a mess. Everything he does is wrong, essentially. Which you know makes what? it so then entertaining. I, I, I feel bad for him then because he, he sounds like he has 
some problems. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> to be, to be nice, you know. And I mean, I don't make fun of anybody because there, there's there's so many people in this world who who have their vices and who have their sicknesses. So I'm not making fun of them. It just turned my stomach. Uh, to hear such a story, and I, I just didn't want to indulge and sit there and watch it because just the, that kind of stuff just turns me off. But if there's more to it than what I, you know, I, I really didn't give it a chance. I gave it five minutes. Um, so, yeah, next time it's on, I'll, I'll tune in and You know what else is happening on VH1? What's that? Um, Maven is showing up to the Surreal Life house. I know, I read that. Good for him. Yeah, everybody Good on your, I, was, I actually was on your forums, and some people were picking on him for uh, doing it. I'm thinking to myself, I, You know hey. what, I don't pick on anybody for that. It, it, whatever, it, it, this kid is finding every break available. First, he does Tough Enough. Whatever you can and do, now he's, whatever you can do to keep that 15 minutes of fame alive, do it. That's what I'm saying, do it. Go, God bless you, do it. Make your money, make your, you know, make your connections, and... Do what you have to do because it, 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 apparently stuff is falling on this kid's lap. Right. And I, I don't have any ill will against him for taking it. And, you know, a lot of people in the business have um, remorse, um, not remorse, uh, I'm sorry, they, they have a grudge against an, anybody who was uh, involved in Tough Enough. Mm -hmm. And, like, oh, my thing is this, like, okay, they didn't pay their dues. We all know that. Yeah. But when we trained, if we had that opportunity – I'm sure some of us would have jumped and did it as well. Well, it's funny. You know, but that was not a, that wasn't available when when some of us were training, you know. And um, the old timers especially get pissed off at it. But I mean, you know, if if you can find a shortcut in life, by all means, take it because life's hard enough as it is. Well, you think someone like Bob Holly, who who is like probably one of the biggest like anti tough enough people out there, if he had the opportunity just to get in the ring and have the kind of you know media exposure that that a Maven had, you know, do you really think he wouldn't have taken it? I'd be up to that's bet what he I'm would. Saying. That's, that's ridiculous. That's what I'm saying. You know? if, if it was available for us, um, and I'm not saying every single person, but if if the door was open that way, do you know how many people would have did it? And, and you know, instead of working for free and putting the ring up and and God knows what else you know some people had to do to get in the business. I mean, sure they would have jumped on it. Definitely. So I don't, I don't hold any, you know, ill will towards any of these kids who go in that way. I mean, they, they got lucky. They yeah. didn't pay their dues. That's, you know, and they have. I, I don't think mm -hmm. they have um, the right to to bitch and complain. Um, you know, the way I hear some of them do. Yeah. Um, you know, about the business because they really have not had it tough like the rest of us. But um, as far as them getting in the way they did, God bless you. You, you found a shortcut. Good for you. Well, and, and everyone that's involved in the wrestling business benefits from this, really. I mean, you know, this real life's a heavily watched show. Right. Maven's going to be in there with some big names. And, you know, you don't think they're going to talk about professional wrestling? Oh, they, they totally you know, will. And, and I've said this before. Maven, he's a good-looking kid, you know, and he, he wants to be an actor from what I know. So, you know, if anybody got that phone call, they would have jumped, uh, you know, on that plane, flew out there, and, and lived in that house in a heartbeat. Hey, why wouldn't you? I mean, you, you see sure. these people. That's another nutty cast that's enjoyable to watch. You know what I mean? Sure. You got that. You know, and in the beginning when, you know, because I watched that show, um, I don't know what season this is, but I've watched a couple seasons of it so far. Right. And everybody says, oh, it's, it's has-beens, it's B-list people. You know what? I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think some people might just need a jump start. Right. To help them, you know, I mean, there, there have been some major stars on that show. And, um, you know, he just was in the right place at the right time. He got lucky again. And, you know, he could get some really, really major uh, connections from this. And, you know, we could see him in movies. You never know. This could open a million doors for this guy. So good for him. Yeah, and with Hogan Knows Best being on there as well. I mean, wrestling, sure. like, I'm, I'm almost surprised, to be honest with you, how VH1 is giving it such mainstream exposure. I've always been a fan of reality TV. Like I'm the big, although this year I didn't watch it, but I've watched Real World. Uh, this year, year is actually started. pretty good. Uh, yeah, and see, I didn't see this year uh, at all because I've just been so busy. I, I haven't been home that much, but um, I've watched it every year. I think I was like 18 when it first started. Yeah, with like <laughs> now the, I'm aging myself. With I'm Puck, right? Puck I haven't seen the, the show. No, since Puck, Puck wasn't the first year. Puck was, no, the, was the third, third one. First year was Eric Nice in New York. Right. Eric Meese was the first year. Yep. Yeah. And the second year the was the Cowboy crush. and the Irishman. I had the biggest crush on the guy, Andre. He had the longest, the, the long hair. He was a musician. Yeah, the bad musician from, like, Seattle. I, I, <laughs> I didn't like Eric. I liked Andre. I don't know. That was my crush for that year. But, yeah, I love reality TV. Like, last night I watched um, The Amazing Race. Do you guys watch that? I don't really watch that one, now. Oh, me. it's the best show on television. I love it. 
so much. I'd watch that from day one. I love that show. Just anything that's real piques my interest. So well, see, I'll, last I'll night the real world was on. You, try. you know, so I had to watch the real world. That's that's almost the problem now. How do you decide what reality TV show to watch? There's so many of them out there. I make yeah. the wise choice, and I watch none of them. <laughs> that's well, my you're choice. You're missing. You're missing out because there's some really good stuff. Like tonight, I watched uh, the Surreal Life. And oh god, that Amoroso from The Apprentice. Don't you hate her? I do, and oh. she's just so crazy. And you know, Janice Dickinson. Um, she's she, nuts. She's nutty too. Who did um, she used to be? She's the, like one of the first like. She's uh, the first supermodel. Yes. Yeah, so, oh. I mean, there's so many girls that claim that anyway that I don't know how you can prove that or not. Is Balky part yeah, talking still on there? Yes. Ah. Oh. I like yeah, Bucky. Balky's on there, and they're labeling him as, like, the big pervert that they have. Yeah. See, well, first, oh, okay, I have to go in order here. First, I watched America's Next Top Model, because uh -huh. that's a really good show, and I really like that. Then, then uh, Janice used to be on that show, but for some reason, they replaced her with Twiggy, who was a model from the 60s. I don't know if you know. Yeah, Janice used, used to be, like, really hard on everyone, right? She was mean. Yeah. yeah she, was, she was the American Idol Simon guy yeah, yeah. on, on yeah. the panel, you know? So now I, you know, I watched that first, and then I went to the surreal life, and like her and Amoroso are just, they're fighting to the death now, and it's just, I don't know if it's a work or not, but I, even if it is, I don't care because it's it's so entertaining. Well, I, that's going to be next episode, I guess. One of these people is playing off a script in the surreal life. I think it's Amoroso. Yeah, and they're teasing that it's her. Or Amoroso, whatever the hell her name is, because she was saying line, give me my line, and they're like, there is no line. You know, you know there's a line and. I, I don't really mind, like, a lot of people. Like, some people understand, like, impressed with this girl actually kind of bothers me. Yeah, like, she just plays up this whole, like, oh, I'm this bad bitch, blah, blah. Bitch diva. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know, you suck in The Apprentice. You suck in The Surreal Life. You know what I'm saying? Why don't you just mm. go home? <laughs> like, I didn't watch The Apprentice, but I knew who she was because of all the, the hype and publicity that she got afterwards. You know, and I didn't like her then, and I really don't like her now. So. You know what's even more interesting? It's like the reality show crossover. Like we had the chick that won one of the first America's Top Models now on My Fair Brady. Yes. I mean, what the hell is My Fair Brady? This Adrian. Is, yeah, this because is. Because they fell in love. They fell in love on the Surreal Life, the season of the yeah. Surreal Life. Yeah. Oh. So she went well, they from. They fell in love. Yeah, then he kicked her out of his house. <laughs> but but that's only because Florence Henderson advised him. <laughs> now, it doesn't, hearing yourself say that, doesn't that sound absolutely ridiculous? <laughs> <laughs> well, because Peter's. I'm calling him Peter. His real mother is dead. so That's he all he'll ever it. be, is Peter. No, he's. He's, he's Peter so much Brady. More, James. He's no, oh, come on. You yeah, ever see so how big this more. guy is? Oh, yeah. He's, he's a budget. I like him. Rumor has it he beat up like X Pac, right? Or <laughs> the real life house. Oh yeah, right. That's awesome. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> I don't know. I can sit here all night and tell you about every reality show because I'm a big mark for them. But um, I don't know anything that that piques my interest. I just didn't like the whole Danny Bonaduce thing because of the cheating aspect. But I'll I'll give it another try. I've just been waiting to find an outlet to discuss my feelings on the show, and I just keep mm -hmm. telling everyone I talk to, I'm like, yo, this show is so good, it's like unbelievable. This guy it's is on just... right now, actually, and I, I just turned the TV off oh. to talk to you guys, but mm. you know how many times they replay that crap? <laughs> It'll be on again. It's just so good. I hope yeah, they do it Yeah, okay, so that's my mission for next week. I'll have to find it and watch it. All right. And give you my opinion. That's How's good. That? I'm, I'm okay. anxious to hear, because next week's going to be off the chain, from what I understand. Really? Okay, I'll, I'll be that. You know, VH1, let me just interject this one last like little tidbit of knowledge I have. VH1 actually had to stop filming this show at a point in time because they really thought he was going to kill himself and actually die. And VH1's like, we don't want to be the first network to have videotape footage of someone actually <laughs> killing themselves. That's really sad. So they, sh they shut down filming for like three weeks. See, now I feel bad for Danny Bonaduce. He's crazy. you know. And, uh, I went from not liking him to feeling really bad for him. You know, he has a radio show out of L.A., if I'm not mistaken. And, like, I've heard, like, tidbits of his show. And there's actually points in the show where he's, like, so retardedly messed up that he just sits there and no one <laughs> says anything. For, like, literally probably 30, 40 seconds. And they're like, uh, then the producer comes on, like, we need to take a break. And we oh come back, God, like, five so minutes awful. later. And he's like, sorry, guys. Chuck enjoys people's misery. <laughs> Listen, well, if you see a car accident, do you slow down and look and see what happened? No, oh, yeah. I get out and see if I can help. Oh, well, that's even better. Well, aren't you that's just a good better. Samaritan? Yes, I am a good Samaritan. I do the right thing. Try it I'll sometime. tell you what I did today that I'm guilty of What's earlier. That? When I was, um, I was babysitting today, and uh, I had to look up something on the computer, and uh, they did a whole thing on Anna Nicole Smith. Oh, boy. And they just kept showing her, like, Speaking of um, a train wreck. Totally, and they kept showing her on um, 
when she did that American Music, I, I think it was the American Music Awards or whatever. When she reverted she back gave, to her retardation? She just gave, like, this ridiculous speech about how she was going to be in a video, and um, I just, I, I watched it, like, 30 times and just was laughing at her, you know? <laughs> and then the next, the next clip was her defending herself, saying the teleprompter, she didn't know how to pronounce a word, so she tried to skip the word. And, like, the way she skipped the words, it made her speech slur because she wasn't sure the next word that was coming out of her mouth. Yeah, and that's like, called quaaludes. Yeah. Well, it, it's sad in a, in a sense because it's like, okay, if she does have a drug problem, like, she needs to get help, which I'm not saying she does because, uh, you know, I am not her, so I'm not going to say she does or she doesn't. But it's just funny that her explanation of it was just like, do you really think people are going to buy this? Oh. Like, she's going on national television saying, well, I couldn't pronounce the word. Well, I got bad news for her, too. She just, uh, from last I heard, she, she put on a lot of weight. She put no, it back she, on. No way. She looked awesome. I heard that she put it back on. That was filmed, like, six months ago, and I heard that she put some weight back on. Hopefully it's oh, not true. Oh, but Did you ever see the VH1 special? I'm talking about VH1 again, where they actually interview her family. Yes. And oh, they God. have, like, no, no teeth. teeth. Oh, yeah, my God. Yeah, that was awesome, too. It was Did so you ever good. see the episode... Wait, did you ever see her episode where she was crawling on the floor? I think she's crawling, like, after Sugar Pie, her dog. She was in a ball gown. This is when she was, like, really heavy. And her butt was too big, and it got stuck between the legs of the, um, the, the table. Oh, no kidding. She got stuck. I felt oh, so bad for her. Because I really like her. Like, I, like she, I, she entertained me. Like, her show entertains me. That's another, like, another reality show I used to love every week was the Anna Nicole Smith show. I think she's a beautiful girl. When she was heavy, she was beautiful. She's, you know, obviously she looks better thin, but... I gotta, I gotta a disagree. I gotta, I gotta disagree have my women too. be able to talk. Oh, she's got a beautiful <laughs> face. Come on. Mm. She's pretty, but she's... I mean, there's she's no... no I can't be attracted girl. to somebody if they sound like uh, somebody who has Down syndrome. I'm sorry. Oh, see, oh. no. That's a shame. All right. Well. Well, enough. Okay. You know what I miss? You, you know what I used to like to watch on VH1? Music videos. I like the um the thing Jericho does. The I love the 80s. That's fun sometimes, but I mean, why don't they have a show where they just play music videos? That's why they created MTV2, and now that's all reality. See, we're baiting ourselves play, by I knowing think they that do about the 80s. They play music videos at like two in the morning from like two to two yeah, forty-five. They do. <laughs> hey, well, we've talked enough about crazy people, so I, I guess we got to parlay this into a crazy wrestling person. Oh, um, I don't want to talk about wrestling. Oh, why not? Do we have to? Okay. I, I mean, I guess we kind of have to. I mean, All we could right. do a reality show sometime, I suppose. Yeah, okay, we will. Go but I want to talk about this guy, the Ultimate Warrior. And Francine, if, you don't want, if you're not familiar with the story, I'll kind of give you a little bit of a rundown here. Uh, I read his rant. It's um, insane. You know what? I, okay, this is what I don't get. Uh -huh. And maybe you guys can fill me in more, because I don't know where the heat stems between him and Vince. Well, I'll like, fill you in. Okay. SummerSlam 1991. This is speculatory, of course. We don't know for fact. This is fact. I know it. It's fact. James knows. Vince McMahon, all right, the main event for SummerSlam 1991 was supposed to be Hogan and the Warrior against uh, Colonel Mustafa and Sergeant Slaughter and some other guy. And the bottom line was Warrior refused to go out to the ring that night unless he got $1 million in unmarked bills. It sounds like something out of Die Hard. But he insisted that he get $1 million in unmarked bills. He went out, did the match, came back from the match and was fired on the spot and essentially that's where all the heat stemmed from because the so fans wait, did he get the million dollars before yes he, he did the ring? and he left and he holy left with the million yeah. yeah he held him up for a million dollars and he did it again he tried to do it again in the in uh 96 he tried to do the exact same thing and uh well vince didn't go for it that time and he just got fired so see i don't know oh. if i believe all that that sounds so like mafio so i'm Dude, telling you did you read that post yeah right <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously the guy's like unstable. I mean, it w there was parts of it that I actually thought were humorous, but I mean, like talking about Bobby the Brain Heenan, like he deserves to die. Oh, that's just wrong. I mean, this guy's this guy's cruising for a bruising, man. Oh yeah. I, I mean, and then uh, this guy is just really unstable. I mean, this guy needs a reality show uh, for some odd reason. Like we saw him at that uh, college talking maybe what six months ago where he told that guy to get that object out of his mouth and suing that he was gay. I mean this guy's just got a problem. He's at a college campus trying to give a professional speech and now oh. he goes on and talks. He calls Triple H a little puffy man and tells him <laughs> to get off the human yeah, girl. I read that. Well you know what? He is a talented writer. <laughs> yeah that he is. Yeah he writes he well. He didn't um, put his um, thoughts into <laughs> really really humorous sentences. Um, I just didn't know where 
you know, all the hostility stemmed from well, because I'm not, I mean, I remember the, watching him to a point, but I don't know the, the background stuff on him. There's another part of the story, and that is when he wanted to go to WCW or when he left Vince the last time, Vince tried to get the name Ultimate Warrior, and if you notice, when he signs his name, he signs it Warrior because he had his name legally changed to Warrior so he can use that name. Which is okay. just weird in and of itself. Yeah, he goes by the name Warrior. That's how he signs his checks. How awkward and weird is that? How about um, that he shoot? What do he call Jr. The dude from Deliverance? <laughs> yeah. That was the one that squealed like the pig. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. And then he insinuates well, that Jerry the King Lawler is gay. Well, he he's very pissed off at this point, which. Um, I, I, you know, like I, I, when I, when I heard about the, the DVD, yeah. when it came out, I said, man, he must have really pissed somebody off because to make a DVD like that, yeah. where all you do is just put somebody down throughout the whole thing, mm. there has to be something going well, on. Well, there's a little bit more to the story that people <laughs> might not have even gotten now. And that Tell just, James. just a couple hours ago. On Bite This on WWE.com, they brought in an impersonator who read the entire speech that he typed out in an exact impersonation that was hysterical of him. Did he look like the Warrior? He wore a wig, and he had a paper mask that looked like the Warrior's face oh, paint. Oh, boy. It was just hysterical. I mean, ah. this guy is not going to be happy when he sees this. Well, I, to some degree, I don't really think they should bury him. Like they're doing, even if he was like an ass clown, the dude still, you know, drew money. And, the money. Yeah, yeah, and kind of paved yeah. the groundwork for some of the, you know, more intense figures in wrestling that we've seen, you know, that high intensity. Right. Like almost the Batista. I mean, Batista got that old shaking the ring ropes and being intense. It, it seems like the, that's a carbon copy of the Ultimate Warrior. And for Triple H to even talk about the Ultimate Warrior, I got to kind of agree with Warrior on this. It's a little bit ridiculous. They were in the ring, what, for 30 seconds? Yeah, but that's got to eat him up inside. Why? What, did he have to do a job on At WrestleMania? Life? He doesn't like to have that over his head that he got, that first of all, he hit the pedigree on him, and he got up within six seconds and just destroyed him. I mean, that has to linger over his head and piss him off. Let's not forget, people that lose to Warrior tend to hold that as a grudge for the rest of their lives, like Hogan specifically had Warrior brought to WCW so he can get that win back. I mean, that wow. shows you how annoyed this guy, people get when they have to lose it. I don't guy. know if I believe that either. Do you think That's Hulk Hogan really... Wait, wait, let, let me ask you this. Wasn't Warrior, or, or the ultimate Warrior, mind you, uh, wasn't he portrayed as like one of the greatest superstars when he was on the roster? Yeah. Yes. Like he was like kind of like Hulk Hogan status, right? right. Absolutely. Okay. So, well, he held the Intercontinental title and the World Heavyweight Championship at a time, that's right? That's what I'm yeah. saying. There, he, there's got to be more to the story for Vince to go all out. And I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's there's people that have dealt with Vince, and not everybody gets a whole DVD devoted to them, as, you know, as, as negatively as this one. I, I got to believe it probably falls somewhere in the middle. I believe the Ultimate Warrior at some point kind of tried to strong arm Vince McMahon, and I believe Vince McMahon um, probably tried to maybe do a little underhanded, you know, deed, you know, maybe copywriting his name, trying to de-push him, whatever the case may be, and it caused some animosity. Do I think that Ultimate Warrior said, you give me a million dollars on Mark Bills? Probably not. Do I think Vince McMahon intentionally tried to sabotage his career? Yeah. Probably not. Um, you know, and, and Ultimate Warrior seems like he just is a little bit paranoid. I mean, he talks about everyone, like, you know, Pat Patterson tried to screw him, Jerry the King Lawler tried to screw him, you know, Johnny Ace, so, I, everyone that basically works at WWE, even like accountants. You mean the that cripple work and the them. homo, or what did he call him? That's, that's just hysterical. Uh, he just, whatever, I mean. I, I can't even say half the things he said in this thing yeah. because we got to say Let me throw out. this at you, boys. Wouldn't it be great, and this is just my Booker mind thinking, if this was all a work and he ends up on the USA Network? Next that would be Monday. phenomenal. <laughs> that would be that would be great. We can have a. Home. That would be great, fucking right there. But do you know how hard that would be for people to think of? Well, the the problem with this. <laughs> I though, just thought of it. It would be a great Actually, idea. Actually, I thought of it when I read the the script. I said, wouldn't it be just so great if we just all just fed into this and it was just this huge work? And then Monday, when we're all watching USA, here comes the warrior. Well, I think that would be here's remarkable. here's the smallest problem with that though. Last I saw the Warrior, he had lost most of his muscle mass, and he has short, graying hair now. And I'm not sure if the people would even believe that it was him if they did see him. I think that it would be such a different look. Like, this guy looks nothing like he looked 10 well, years ago. you saw how big he was. I mean, yeah. there's obviously ways that he could get to be that size again. 
I think it would just be a great angle if they, you know, if they pulled that off. That it, it just created such a buzz on the internet. Like, I was just thinking today as I'm reading, I'm like, well, that would be tremendous if this was a work and he just showed up. Well, hey, there's definitely going to be more to this story. I wouldn't be surprised if this Monday night on Raw, when it redebuts on USA Network, someone takes maybe not an out and out right shot, but someone kind of says something that will, uh, you know, those of us who follow the story will tell you be what. clear that they're shooting on Ultimate Warrior. I'll tell you what. I sent him an email, and I'm going to say it right here on the air. I'm issuing, uh, issuing him open mic. He can come on for 10 minutes and say whatever he wants. We won't censor him. Go for it, man. Let's see what you got to say. Don't worry about the Internet. Take live radio by storm. I'm not going to offer that same thing because I'm not going to let him go uncensored. <laughs> Just asking for you trouble. Mean, you, don't, you don't want him to say that Triple H works out like a T-W-A. You can't even spell that, dude, so don't even start. <laughs> well, I stopped. I, I, I spelled an airline, so that's good. Right on. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Francine, you're going to stay with us, all right? Whatever you need, man. All right, we're going to come back, and we're going to talk a little bit of Raw, so make sure you keep it right here on the Wrestling Up Center here on The Blaze, 1260 AM. Hey, this is Batista, world heavyweight champion, and you're listening to Blaze, 1260 AM. Yo, maniacs, this is Hulk Hogan, the greatest of all time, and you're listening to the Blaze, 1260 AM. So what you going to do when Hulk Hogan in Blaze Mania runs wild on you? And we are back here on the Wrestling Epicenter on the Blaze, 1260 AM. I just got an interesting IM. Apparently, it was Matt Stryker that was impersonating the Ultimate Warrior. Really? Isn't that something? He's very good. He, he would do that on the indie scene a lot uh, with his impersonation. Would of, he really? Of different wrestlers, yeah. Yeah, well, th thank you for, uh, I, I guess it's Meta Life and four that's IMing me and telling me this. We, we appreciate the uh, quick news update. We're going to move on to Raw. This was the final Raw we're going to see on Spike TV. It emanated from Waco, Texas. Fireworks went off, and of course, we hear the music of Mr. McMahon. That's always a great way to start off the show, isn't it? Oh, yeah, but then the real fireworks went off when they decided to censor him in a conversation we had just last week. Can you say USA Network on Spike? The answer is no. Unless it's the second hour of the show. Or, or unless Jerry the King Lola just says it in the middle of a sentence. He'll start saying one thing, and then he'll say, by the way, we're on, the, we're on USA Network Or unless week. Jonathan Coachman just says it 50 million times in a row. Yeah, right, because they'd end up <laughs> deeping the whole show, which right. would be ridiculous. They but, censored him when he tried to say, our good friends at Spike censored us, and he tried to say it again, and they censored him. I thought that was hysterical. It was a mess. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you what. I'm it not reminded really... me of Paul Heyman at ECW. I, I, I got to say this, though. So, I'm not really kind of a fan of, of what the WWE did. Um, obviously, we had Shawn Michaels come out. Obviously, Kurt Angle came out. Um, and they announced a 30-minute Iron Man match. This is kind of like a backhanded jab at TNA here. TNA had a couple weeks ago announced AJ Styles um, versus Christopher Daniels, Christopher Daniels yeah. in a 30-minute Iron Man match for their debut on Spike TV. <laughs> and now, like two weeks later, for their homecoming. For homecoming. Yeah. Vince they get McMahon that now does a 30-minute Iron Man match. Guys, I mean, do come not on. forget the Nitro versus Raw. One would be taped, and they would give away the, the main event on the other channel. Yeah. Please, can we go back a couple years and remember oh, yeah, this? They absolutely. don't care. But the thing is, this is it. A, why is Vince McMahon even lowering himself to TNA, who has not even really proved themselves at this point? Right? Dude, yeah. watch that. Don't Because don't go now there. they're on Spike, which, which they are coming off of. He so has if to TNA him. does better on Spike than they did, Oh, God forbid. Watch out. Yeah, but that, that's not even possible. It's like comparing apples and oranges. What are they going to compare it to? Velocity? Well, I mean, cause that's or, the time you know, slot we're going to have in. to wait and see. Dude, if they're he, successful. An alternative. Would, these numbers might go through the roof for Spike TV, the first show. I hope. I really do. And, you know? It, but at this not point. I'm not saying they will, but they might. I, I'm know? just saying I don't think that Vince really needs to, at this point in time, alter his program to kind of take no. shots at TNA. I, I don't believe that TNA is proved themselves enough yet to warrant that kind of attention. It would kind of like be being uh, WWE being in the United States and TNA being Guam. It wouldn't be really a good war. It would just be a complete domination right there. But like they keep saying, and we had uh, Billy Gunn on the show a couple weeks ago, whatever he goes by now, Kip James, terrible name, terrible name. Um, mm. He talks about if they went head-to-head, -head, they would get crushed in the ratings, so they decided let's just go on Saturday and be an alternative for now until we build our fan base, which they've been trying right. to do for three years, but who knows? Maybe this time it'll uh, stick. Well, nevertheless, it was a good segment. We saw Vince McMahon, Shawn Michaels, Kurt Angle. They all talk well. They're all interact well in the ring. Um, and to set up our first match, which was a uh, women's championship match, we saw Victoria take on Trish Stratus. Obviously, it all broke down. We had Candice Michelle come out. Tori Wilson was there with this little puppy. 
Uh, Ashley <laughs> came out. Candace got stripped down naked. And yeah. Trish retained the title. That's... I liked everything but the promo at the end. You didn't really? like the promo? Mm-mm. Really? Why not? I, I, I didn't like the, the way she delivered it. You th- really? You think it was a little bit too extreme? No, I, it wasn't the wording. It was just her pauses were just too long. And unless she was blown up, like you had mentioned earlier, the warrior was blown <laughs> up. I don't. Now you might. Now he might not come on because the. <laughs> hey, that, that, that was taken it. from an yeah, official wrestling a, dictionary. Yeah, we're trying uh, to work with TNA, and Chuck comes and says, "I don't think they're anything special." So I didn't say that. Job, dude. Listen, uh, I'm not going to change my opinion. Do I think that Vince should waste his time on trying to shoot on TNA at this point in time? No, I don't. I think that he should, you know what I mean, stick focus and do what he's got to do. Yeah. Why would he even get? He's giving them more publicity by saying, "Now we want to have a 30-minute Iron Man match." Why would you say it's your competition? That, oh, you had a good idea, now I want to use it. That's like, I don't understand that to me. It doesn't make any sense. Because he thinks that watching WWE superstars in an Iron Man match is better than seeing TNA superstars in an Iron Man match. That's that's where he's going with that. I guess it depends. Uh, I'd almost probably disagree. If it wasn't Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle, I would almost definitely disagree with that. It's kind of like anything you can do, I can do better. It's kind of what he's. But it would make more sense if they were head to head. Right. Uh, That's what I mean. It's like he's giving him free publicity. I don't understand it. Well, he's not giving him any publicity because unless unless you're really thinking about it, you don't know this that they're having an Iron Man match. Anyone listening to the show, obviously has an interest in wrestling, so they follow it. Right. So they obviously thought to themselves, it's kind of ironic that two days ago I heard TNA, or two weeks ago TNA was doing a 30-minute Iron Man match, and now WWE is doing it. People are not stupid. They're also using Homecoming. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I don't, I don't, Come on now. I you just, like that, don't you? I love it. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Anywho, I think Candace is a beautiful girl. I think her, her work in the ring is improving. Um, but I, I just, I, there was something lackluster about her promo to me. I don't I don't know. I think it, it just drugs. You know, the one thing I kind of didn't really enjoy about it was the fact that she made it seem like a bra and panties match is like the hardest chorus thing that we're because ever going to see Because she did TV. it in the diva search. Yeah. She ran around half the time naked in the diva search. Yeah, so, but like, she's going to be in Playboy. So, I mean, if you're ashamed of being seen naked, then... Right. Don't be ashamed that you got stripped naked in the ring. I mean, I was just happy Victoria got to wrestle. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, she looked good. That's I popped huge. When I saw her in the middle, I was like, all right, the girl's going to wrestle tonight. So that made me happy. What about the next match? We saw Big Show versus uh, Mr. Snitsky. And uh, the Big Show took the win. There was a little like bit of uh, Snitsky. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of hard to say. It doesn't roll off my tongue that well. <laughs> Me neither, but it's fun. <laughs> it kind of fits him. He's a, he's an ugly dude, and, and that name fits him. It's an ugly name for an ugly dude. It he's just... not an ugly guy. You don't think he's ugly? Who do you think is ugly? Ugly, to me, ugly is a very strong word. I find beauty in everybody. Aww. Ugly, to be ugly, you have to be disfigured or, uh, he, you know, I'm, I, I don't think he's ugly. He's huge. I, when I met him at the pay-per-view, I had to look up at him. I was like, wow. He's a big guy, you know. Yeah. I don't think he's. I think ugly is a really strong word. Hmm. Maybe, maybe we throw it around a little more. You seem to throw around a lot on this show. I, <laughs> about you know, other men. I, oh, come on now. I had not heard you one time say well, any of the divas are ugly. Because they're not. <laughs> well. They're hot. The uh, men, well, the men are. Uh, oh, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? What am I gonna say? Tori Wilson's ugly? No. No, and she and and. And I'm a woman, and I can admit when a woman's beautiful doesn't mean I'm gay. <laughs> Is that what you're afraid of? N- me? No. Either. No. I just think well, that Snitsky's a big... Well, a man is good-looking. I would say is a good-looking guy. Randy Orton's a good-looking guy. Okay. But Gene Snitsky? Right. No. Er, er, er. He's not ugly. Yeah. It's just like the Keen thing. I don't think Keen's ugly. I don't think Snitsky's If I saw either of them and I was a chick in a dark alley, I'd be afraid for, like, my safety. I'd go <laughs> oh, the other way. I've seen men that are... Oh, please. Well, all right. <laughs> I'm, maybe I'm just Moving a wuss. Moving on. <laughs> so Moving we saw on. them in the match. Obviously, Big Show got the win. A quick short match. A few hardcore elements tossed into it. We saw some Trash cans, yada yada. I yada. love what they're doing with the big show. For the first time in a long time, they're making him seem like a monster. I like the match. He should be a monster. He's huge. Yeah, yeah. but the, the problem was, and nobody will agree with me on this, and this is the biggest argument I've ever had with people, was back when we had Andre the Giant, he only got slammed by Hogan. And then for a while there, Big Show was being picked up by anybody he wrestled. So mm-hmm. 
it kind of killed the novelty of it. Yeah, but look yeah. at what that did for Brock Lesnar. Look at the rub that gave him when he first F5 to the big show. Right. That's was huge. Yeah. And then when John Cena did it, it's and look what it did for Matt Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very nice, dude. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why they let that guy go in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Budget cut. Budget you know? cuts, yeah. Whatever. Budget cut. Hey, next we saw Ric Flair come down to the ring. What do we Woo! think of this? I, I don't exactly know what we to make of it. We loved it. We loved it. Yeah, we loved it. it. You like the right James? It, it was sensational. But now, does this mean that he's expected to be friends with Triple H when Triple H comes back, or what is he expecting? I didn't really get. Maybe I just missed it. I, I, you know what I'm saying? I don't get why he's a face. So I don't get why Triple H would be a face, but I don't get it. I, I think Marie is going to be pregnant with his baby. <laughs> that'd be a good. Uh, that'd be a good angle. Why not? You think it'd be a good angle? Uh, no. maybe, if she gives birth to a hand, it'd be great. Oh, oh please. <laughs> well, hey. Make it, up, make it a foot this time. Oh, let's just not do make any it of it. Based on your website, I think yeah, some of your fans would like the foot. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I might do that on my site. Never mind. I'm, I'm going to uh, trademark that idea. Okay. Next, we saw Shelton Benjamin and Kerwin White. It's what, the second time we've seen Kerwin White. Obviously, uh, he picked up the win via interference he, with, by his uh, new caddy, who I guess is an OVW talent. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just me personally. I don't think Kerwin White's the kind of guy that needs someone out there with him. Eh, I no. think there's so many other people that need need a good quality, you know, valet. Such yeah, a I think I think uh, Chavo's got enough um, heat on him as it is. Yeah, he's I mean, just with the gimmick itself. They should know? let him talk more. He's hysterical when he talks. I mean, he he's is funny, and I'm still I'm still putting my money on a, a racial. Thing. They haven't, I, I think it's coming. They haven't really yeah. gone that route yet, which kind They're of surprises me. They have Mark to. My word. They keep putting these guys in the ring together. They got to go there somewhere. His back of his shirt, real big, says white, and he's carrying around golf clubs. <laughs> <laughs> come on now. It's a little messed up. <laughs> that is so stereotypical. Uh, yeah, come on. It's definitely going to boil down to a, a racial thing. The next segment for my money had to be segment of the night simply because of of the bump. At the very end of this, it was uh, the Edge and Lita promo on Matt Hardy plugging their ladder match for next week on their USA, you know, re debut. And uh, Matt Hardy runs out, tips that ladder over, and Edge, I, I, I was so surprised he even got up, man. I'm like, oh. I thought he broke his leg because his leg hit it. I thought there was a very good possibility he hyperextended his. It looked bad. Oh, I thought he hyperextended himself there. I'm surprised he got up. Oh, he got up, and from what I saw, he looked okay, and he was on bite this earlier, and he looked fine. So hopefully uh, everything's okay. You know, this is the match I'm probably most looking forward to, aside from the Shawn michaels um, Kurt Angle match. They're kind of building this up as a pay-per-view, which is good. Well, we got three yeah. hours. Plus, we're going to have a SmackDown match, we found out. Yeah. I don't know if I really like that idea. Um, it kind of goes against the whole, you know... I don't like brands. it for all. No. Yeah, I, I don't know. No, I, I don't think they should have did that for all. I think they're just trying to put everything on this show just to make people be like, oh, what's going on, you know? Yeah. Oh, and I, but, I think it's a good idea. Um, it depends mm -hmm. on the match they give us. Um, I, I'd assume they have to have Batista on, right? Right. You would think, but who knows? I mean, he is the champion, um, you know, a former Raw superstar. He'll definitely get an excellent reaction. Um, who they'd have him face? I don't really know. Yeah. I, I would probably expect some sort of tag team action, to be honest with you, so they can get a few more of the SmackDown names on the show. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Um, that, that's how I would see it going. Solid about. booking idea there, Chuck D. Hey, thank you, my man. <laughs> Up next, we saw Val Venus and Viscera. Uh, what do they call these guys? V squared or something? Did they have a name? Yeah, oh, Jim, I Ross didn't catch that. Jim Ross came up with the name. It was like V squared or V2 yeah. or something. Ugh. I don't know. Nonetheless, that's, that's they're taking on Lance Actually, Maiden. if you think about it, there's three Vs. So, V Q. Yeah, Vale, or... Venus, and Viscera. Yeah? Yeah. They took on Lance Cade, Trevor Murdoch, who are the tag team champions. It was actually, uh, you know, another decent match. I mean, n nothing really, you know, set the yeah, world on fire. it's fine. But, hey, it was solid. And uh, we had winners by disqualification were Vale, Venus, and Viscera, which obviously is going to, you know, set this up as a little bit more of a continuing feud. Um, mm -hmm. Which I don't know exactly how I feel about yeah. that because what about Rosie and, and uh, the Hurricane who just lost the tag team titles? Shouldn't they be kind of in a program right now? There's not enough the... tag teams. There's just not enough tag teams. So you yeah, it's, go... it's lackluster the tag division right now. So There's I mean, you just really no storylines that are being continued or anything. So anybody who shows up on TV is eventually ends up with a tag team title. So you know, it's... yeah. The only ones, the only exception to that rule is the heartthrobs, and they're funny as hell. So and they're I love on that. TV. Yeah, they're, no, they're jobbing on heat, which. 
Yeah, you're right. It's not even on TV. Yeah, They're right. working in OVW too, aren't they? Are yeah, they? yeah. Back and oh, forth, pretty... yeah. Yeah, they, they do both, trying to get as They're much humorous, as possible. They're humorous, man. They make me smile, those kids. They're funny. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'd like to see them. The next match I have to be kind of a little bit tough on. We've seen Eugene again uh, versus Rob Conway. Oh, my Lord. Eugene is not even remotely entertaining at this point in time. I don't know if it was because I was expecting him to be off TV so long ago. Like, what, three weeks, four weeks ago, we were sitting here talking about how Kurt Angle whooped the crap out of him. Yeah. And now he's back on TV every week, um, almost looking better and better um, as far as, like, you know, what he's doing in the ring. But he's looking better, but you're unhappy to see him. Well, because he's not getting any kind of positive response. Flip, flop, flop, flip. No, I'm not flip-flopping. He's just not getting any kind of positive response. I mean, he obviously needs to do something to change it up a little bit. And having him come out with the doll that he talks to is really not what... Uh, it's like, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was like, this Bobby? is... Uh, <laughs> no, I actually thought of a stupid Al Snow ripoff where he's talking to a head. <laughs> oh! Rats for me! I, what? I loved head. That was I'm not saying it's bad. I washed head's hair. Did you really? <laughs> and combed it and conditioned it for Al. Yes, I did, because it was so nappy. Are you serious? Um, yeah. You conditioned Head's hair? I did. <laughs> wow. It was looking pretty nasty, and I said, Al, give me this, because I need to wash and condition Head's hair, and I did. Well, this was like a bad ripoff of that. And it was it was upsetting. I, I, I maybe well, it was. Did you, just not, did it you stupid. like the angle with Al and Head? Oh, I didn't say that was stupid. I said that this is like a stupid ripoff. No, dude, you said it was stupid. No, I like, dude, all I can remember is when they threw in like a thousand different heads in the ECW ring and everyone like crazy. That was insane. That was awesome. That. that was great stuff right there. That's what got him over. I loved Head. Do you remember we interviewed Al Snow and I talked to him about Head and I, I told him that I liked Head. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What guy doesn't like Head? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. You can't complain here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. But this but is Eddie. like a bad reenactment of it, I think, because he looks at it and kind of pets it a little bit. And I'm like, now what? They're just making this guy go from kind of like Rain Man-ish to like completely like delusional? That's not going to help save his character. Just get him off TV. Let him cut his hair and come back. Oh, God. Come on now. And then, oh, whatever. And I'm just so sick of him ripping off everyone else's moves. It was That's like, his gimmick, dude. It was good the first it's few times. It's his gimmick. But now every week, to hear JR be like, oh, Shades of the Great Junkyard Dog. Maybe if he went through and did, like, a whole bunch of different people's moves, but he just uses, like, the same three. It's just annoying to me now. I don't like to see him on TV. I don't mean to be negative. I just don't like it. <laughs> it's just You don't mean me. to be <laughs> negative, but you are. Calm down, dude. It wasn't that bad. Well, at least Rob Conway got the win. Yes, he did, and it was a good finish. I love that finish. Yeah. I wanted Eugene to win. Why? Because she's our Eugene mark. Because I like him. <laughs> yeah, but don't you like Rob Conway? I hate Rob Conway's music. You don't like that? <laughs> well, that's good. That means it's doing the right job. <laughs> oh, exactly. It's oh, no, <laughs> believe me. I think he's he's incredible looking, and he's a great worker. But I just feel, uh, like like I said before, I just feel bad for Eugene. You know, he went from getting, like, an Uber push to nothing, and I just, I don't know. I feel bad for him. Yeah, yeah unfortunate. I, I love his theme song, by the way, Rob Conway. I think it's hysterical. No, it gets on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> it is annoying, but... Yeah, Louis Armstrong, funny. it sounds like. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> it just gets on my nerves. But anyway, yeah, they're, they're, they're not going to advance him, I suppose. Um, I don't know. Maybe he's just going to be another Barry Horowitz, you know? Uh, yeah, that's a horrible thought. Why? Well, it, Barry Horowitz was a jobber. He put in a successful yeah, but, career. Yeah, but in your words, James, at least he's getting a paycheck. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Man, so, and, and look at we're talking about Barry Horowitz. I mean, that dude kind of left the legacy. I remember when <laughs> Barry Horowitz had a T-shirt. <laughs> oh, no doubt he did, but I'm I'm saying that he was never great. was a major no. player. No, no. But he always had work. I think the only thing he ever did that ever got him over was, or, you know, on an actual winning streak was when he beat Chris Candido. Yeah. And, Chris, and from that day on, Chris will come to the ring and pat himself on the back. It was yeah. great. <laughs> I loved it. And uh, they, they then did us a quick rundown of what will be on the WWE homecoming. We have the WWE champion John Cena versus Eric Bischoff, which, of course, uh, should be a squash match. Uh, I can't imagine Eric Bischoff would actually get the title off Cena in, in this fashion. Um, we saw the loser leaves Raw money in the bank ladder match. I'm watching to see that one. That's what I'm it's watching It's going to be for. so good. Oh, yeah. i, I got to believe Matt Hardy's heading to SmackDown, but I don't know. I think they might swerve us here, dude. They might, because it's very plausible that Edge could go over to SmackDown. you got to think, Smackdown. what do they need on SmackDown worse than anything? And that's plausible heels, heels. to compete with Batista. I hear you. So that might be good. 
They also plugged the 30-minute Iron Man match, Kurt Angle versus Shawn Michaels, Handicap Braun Panties match, Trish Stratus, Ashley Massaro versus Victoria Candice and Tori, Mick Foley on Piper's Pet with Mr. Rowdy Rowdy Piper. I heard they're going to do some kind of battle of the socks, which I hope is wrong. I, don't know. I heard Piper's going to have his own sock puppet, and, the, and it's going to be so mm -hmm. Mr. Socko against Roddy Piper. Now, what sock. about this Stone Cold returns and someone's in for it or something like that? I, I, what is the point of this? I think it should be. I think they should plant the seed for Hogan Austin for WrestleMania. If they did that, that would be pretty smart. I think they should plant the seed. Uh, my idea was that they keep talking about a youth movement, right? Well, how about the main event is Hogan, Piper, and Foley against, say, Chris Masters, uh, Rob Conway, and Carlito. And since we say that them losing doesn't do anything, Hogan could pin Carlito, and great, Carlito gets to lose again and gets another rub. And uh, at the end of the, at the end of the night, Francini is making fun of us. No, I am. I'm sorry. I disagree with I'm, you guys. I'm just listening to him. At the end of the at the end of the show, the glass breaks, and Austin walks down to the ring, and the, f the show ends with a face off between Hogan and Austin, just to plant that seed, to make you want it for WrestleMania. Now, granted, WrestleMania is far off. But you got to plant that seed early. Yeah. That would be a huge match to see. Oh, everybody's been talking about it for the past two years. And by all indications, that seems to be where they're going. So if that is where they're going, I think now might be a good time to plant that seed. Right on. Final match of the evening, we saw Carlito and Chris Masters versus Shawn Michaels and John Cena in a uh, tables match. First person is thrown through a table uh, is actually the loser. This was actually not a bad match by my account. Um, everyone worked well. Chris Masters worked well. Carlito worked well. John Cena worked well. Of course, Shawn Michaels worked well. Um, this was a good main event, and it was given enough time. What did we go through? Two commercial breaks on this main event? Yeah, it was actually a really good match, and finally Carlito and Masters got a win. I wish it would have been more of a singles win for them, or at least a clean one, but it's good that they got the win, and... Um, you know? Yeah, but what right. about that spot at the end, man? There was two of them. We saw Shawn Michaels go through the table. That was excellent. And we saw Cena get busted open somewhere. We don't know exactly where when he went through the table. Yeah, that did not look good. <laughs> I mean, it, it didn't look serious, but nonetheless. Oh, no, yeah, but it doesn't look like it would be fun. No. No. Tables are not fun. I can't imagine they are. No, they're really not. They're, they're a little scary, but, you know. How much does that they really hurt? What's that? How much does that really hurt? It hurt. Like on it, a scale of 1 to 10. Ten being like, say, holy crap, that really sucked bad. I'm going to say for me it was a solid nine only because I weigh, uh, when I did my first table spot, I was like 117 pounds. Oh. So they got to have a lot and of force to get you through that. I have, you know, I don't really have, a, you know, a lot of uh, back, <laughs> not meaning my butt, I'm just my literally my back, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And if there's no meat on you, you're going to feel every bump you take and that was like there's no cushion oh really. nothing yeah there was nothing and uh, you're you just i just remember hitting the table hitting the mat and just being like oh relief because it's done but yeah it hurt yeah chuck it, and i it's not pleasant chuck and i keep talking about wanting to do our own indie show out here because there's just no really good uh indie wrestling out this way and we see that there's a market for it but every time we start talking about it, he's like i don't care what we do or who we bring in i want to get put through a table i do i want to try it i want to be like there well, I you did it. Wrestle James. I oh. I do it. I keep telling him he can't get out of my master lock. You know. <laughs> oh, so you're gonna do? Oh, uh, see, this is the typical crappy indie show where all the kids come out and do WWE things. Not, o not and only that. Play their theme music. Yeah, and absolutely. Then everybody rips off everybody's moves. Notice I'm not saying anything here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So don't, don't include me in this. Oh. Absolutely, we'd come out to the same music. Now, actually, there's a funny story that Jake Roberts did one of those shows once where they were all imitators, and yeah. he was the only real guy there, and none of the fans believed it was him. He just kept saying, "No, it's me. I, this the Undertaker's not five foot ten, but this is me," and nobody believed him. Right. But yeah, it's, I uh, go through a table. I want to see. I, I do kind of want to know what it's like in a way. It sucks. Believe me. Well, what's worse, going Take through a table or it. taking a chair shot? Oh, ooh, chair shots are bad if you don't block them. Yeah, that'll ring your bell. See, I was told not to block anything. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> because great it advice. looks more real if you don't, you it know? It looks more real if it is real. <laughs> it's, well, yeah. It's like the night I got hit in the face with the cane. Yeah. And Polly tells me, keep your hands down. Do yes. not block it. Okay, Paul, what do I do? I, I feed for it with my face and get hit right in the face. And I'm saying to myself, your first 
instinct, if something's coming at you, you're going to block it. Yeah, or well, at least you should. Come on, Francis. If, if any intelligent person is going to block it, not me. Didn't I they censor that when they put it on TV? That, it, yeah. Why I have did they it, do that? I think I have it uncensored. Um, I, I've you can't a lot. show a chick just getting swatted in the face with a stick. Why not? I've bled a lot from it. Oh, um, that's not good. I my mouth open. And, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> it hit me right in the, in the cheekbone, but it also hit me in my mouth. And oh. it busted my mouth. Available now in the archives at interactivewrestlingradio.com. It's our exclusive interview with the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. So no, I, I, we respect each other in the ring and what we've done. And there's a respect there. And there, and even though if he would say something bad, he kept coming back to that respect thing. Uh, people had told me, but there's a respect there. But it's, a, it's business. Business is business with me and him. This classic 2005 interview can be heard at WrestlingEpicenter.com and InteractiveWrestlingRadio.com. Welcome back to the Wrestling Epicenter. Right now we're being joined by Michael Moody, who just released a fantastic film titled 100 and Re- 101 Reasons Not to Be a Professional Wrestler. Michael, how you doing today? Thanks for having me on. It's good to have you on the program. I've just watched the uh, thing all the way through, all the extras included, and i got to say this is one hell of a product. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely different than whatever wrestling fans have seen before. Now, I think, uh, you know, there isn't many documentaries, or maybe not a documentary, but like a, a, a full enough product or pro, uh, uh, production that encompasses like so many different wrestlers and so many different opinions. And so many people have experienced so many different things. So it's like when, when a, especially like just a fan who like just reads the internet, um, like sees it, they're really, uh, they're really amazed by it. And people who don't read the internet that I've seen see it, that, that I've watched it, I've given copies to, they like it blows their mind. They're like, wow, I didn't know all this stuff, you know. So it's really a cool production for the fans. Essentially, what it seems to be is just a whole gaggle of shoot interviews all packed into one three-hour session. Yeah, it was a mix. There's like got to be like 10 to 13 different wrestlers in there. I, you know, I, I haven't really counted, but there's a lot. I mean, you have Conan, you have BDP, you have Joni Lauer, formerly known as China. There's Rikishi in there, now known as Fatu, uh, Vampiro, uh, Sean O'Hare. The, no, the list goes on. There's so many wrestlers in it that it's like, you know, like shoot interviews to me, are they're cool, but I get so bored of watching like somebody talk for three hours. Right. I can't sit down and watch it in one session. I have to hit pause and go do my thing and come back to it. Yeah. So, like, that's one of the things I want. I, I like to do personally is uh, I like to get a lot of people and then edit it all together so it's more of a story being told rather than just one person telling the story of their career because that, like, you know, ROH does those things good um, and that's cool if that's what you want to see but I like to have, like, a bigger picture personally more of a production feel to it, you know? Right, right. And one thing that you do in this is, like, you ask, for example, Fatu or somebody along those lines, well, what do you think of backyard wrestling? And you hear their answer, but then five seconds later you fast forward and you're at Conan and then you're at um, somebody who's actually been in backyard wrestling videos and Tylene Buck. You guys did a tremendous job with this. I, I really, and a lot of these people we've interviewed, and I've actually spoken to a few of them about it, and those who actually remember what the hell it was, and not to put it down, um, said that it was a lot of fun to do, and that they thought that, um, having seen it, they thought it was really good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy with the production and some of the technical errors on the DVD that I had in the past with lighting, like on DDP, and like minor audio issues uh, are all, they've all been fixed, so when it does, if it, it'll get released in stores, and there's a chance it might end up being advertised during, uh, WWE Raw and SmackDown, uh, this one distribution company I'm talking to might release it and advertise it on commercials. And uh, when it gets to that level, when it's released, it's going to be, you know, the, all the odd, all the technical things are fixed already. So it's like the, the production's even better than it was when those people saw it. So it's an impressive little piece, you know? Well, let me ask you this. Out of all the people you had the opportunity to follow around and, and discuss their wrestling careers with, who do you enjoy um, talking to the most? Uh, definitely New Jack because New Jack is uh, New Jack's like it's a free-spirited person, man, that will say anything that he wants to say, and he doesn't care if he pisses off Vince McMahon 
He doesn't care if he shoots on TNA. He doesn't care. Uh, I mean, that, that, that guy will just say anything as long as he feels it's appropriate for him to say. And even if it's not appropriate for him to say, he's probably going to say it anyway. <laughs> He'll say he just speaks his mind, and you have to respect him for that. Because so many people in this business are like so tight-lipped about, you know, uh, just burning bridges that maybe they shouldn't burn. But at the same time, it's all wrestling's a work. It's all, uh, it's all just a storyline. It's all fake. And sometimes, uh, you know, the fans know that. The fans just have fun with it. The fans like to read about it on the internet or whatever. But you know what? The biggest marks and the people who take the wrestling business so serious are the wrestlers themselves. It's not the fans, it's the wrestlers. And, like, New Jack's just one of those people who just doesn't take the business that seriously, unlike everybody else. Oh, man. And New Jack certainly has given a lot to the business in his own way. Um, the guys, I believe, and I'm not sure if you mentioned it there, I can't recall, he's got, like, blindness in one of his eyes based on the crap that he's done in ECW. Yeah. He's a crazy guy, but let me ask you this. I was sitting down and watching it, and I'm watching Vampiro come on the screen, and it seems like a lot of his answers were kind of like what he was doing was beneath him. Did you get that impression from him at all? Um, like when you say beneath him, you're talking about like indie wrestling, or? Well, maybe that, or sitting down and talking to you. He was just kind of seemed like he had a bit of an attitude about him. Uh, you know what, Vampiro? Like I've known Vampiro for like honestly probably going on like five years now, where. He, uh, like, he's not, like, beneath, like, he doesn't look at, like, doing an interview with me or like that. He just looks at it like, he's just talking, talking trash and just having fun with it. Um, he's, like, new, Vampiro's, like, just really a cool guy, but at the same time, like, he's not, uh, giving me attitude. He's just, like, kind of just talking trash about the business in the video, I feel. He's tired of it, right? Yeah, I mean, he's not tired of it. tired of the crap, anyway. Yeah, exactly, like, it's all just politics and games, and he just... You know, he just speaks his mind similar to New Jack, and, um, you know, it, yeah, you know, Vamp, like, feels he should be, like, in one of the bigger companies. Um, I think there was talk about him going to TNA, but, uh, I don't know why Vince never brought him in, you know, like, that whole supernatural angle or gimmick that the Undertaker could draw money. There's, like, several different things they could do that, uh, would be good for him, but for whatever reason, you know, Vamp could just be victim of his own mouth where, he said certain things that shouldn't have been said, and he says them still to this day, and he might regret some of what he said, just like he says in the video. But, you know, that's just part of him as a person, and he can't hold somebody's opinion uh, to, like, hold them back in his business. But unfortunately it does in, in the eyes of, like, Vince or maybe TNA or whoever, you know. Hmm. Yeah, we actually had a chance to sit down with uh, Sean O'Hare, and Sean is a great guy, but let me be honest with you, he's a little frightening. I think he could snap at any time. Uh, standing in front of Sean O'Hare, you know, he tells the truth about everything, but did you get the impression that he might be um, a little out there? Yeah, Sean's like, uh, I don't know, I only really hung out with him for probably that day, about an hour, like, total. Um, and he's kind of like a loose cannon to an extent. I, I, can, I can see that. But as long as you're cool with him, and he's cool with you. But if you... If you if you burn a bridge with him or you say something negative to him, he he'll probably get in your face. Oh yeah. Like when I asked him when I asked him about uh, the drug business and uh, uh, the, how the drugs affect the wrestling business, he was like, "Where's this video going?" Like and right there, like I mean, Sean O'Hare's not the kind of person you want to put on the spot about drugs, you know. Especially, I mean, there's no proof that he's done them, but assuming that he's been wrestling in WCW and WWE. Uh, you know, he probably came across it a few times, just assumptions there on my mind. Oh, yeah. But, um, you know, he just, he was like, uh, where's this going? He already said no comment. He's all, where's this video going? I was just like, oh, you know, I don't <laughs> know where it's going, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, because, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and, like, get a beating from Sean O'Hare. <laughs> he's, he's a badass. <laughs> yeah, he's not a, he's a nice guy, don't get me wrong, but if you piss him off, then... Uh, you, you got to be able to run fast. Uh, I I totally agree with that. He seemed real mellow with us. Um, yeah. and then again, he was also just finished, you know, training for uh, uh, ultimate fighting. So, you know, maybe he got his aggression out earlier in the day. But going back to the drugs, how much of that did you encounter um, uh, on your rounds for making this film, or did you not encounter any at all? Encounter what? Uh, any drug use or, or steroid abuse or anything like that when you were trying to make the film. Um, you know what, uh, I'll keep things anonymous here, <laughs> I can mention names, but, 
There was a time uh, when I was shooting 101 Reasons Not to Be a Pro Wrestler where one of the people on the DVD did get on the phone in front of one of my uh, uh, crew and asked for an 8-ball, uh, which for the people that don't know out there, an 8-ball usually is sold as like, uh, I believe it's an eighth of an ounce of cocaine or an eighth of an ounce of methamphetamines. Um, chances are they were hooking up cocaine. And it was just a phone call, like, hey, have the, have the eight ball ready for us. So, like, that was there. That did happen. And you know what? I'm shooting a new wrestling DVD right now, a new documentary that's going to be, I'm trying to make this thing way bigger than anything I've already done. And when I was there, um, one of the guys that I did ask, I don't know, I don't remember if I asked him about drug abuse or not, but um, he did pull out, like, you know, like how wrestlers wear that fanny pack? Right. He pulled out. Like, like he, his fanny pack was full of prescription bottles, and he was offering prescription pills to one of the other wrestlers that I shot an interview with that day. But the other wrestler didn't want any. He was like, no, nah, I'm cool. But this guy who formerly does, did work for some big companies did, uh, you know, he had a full fanny pack full of prescription pills, which to me, I mean, prescription pills are only so bad, especially when you're on the road trying to, like, you know, kill your pain or whatever, but still, I mean, I, I think, like, the drug abuse problem in the industry, like, it's something that's been ignored, especially online, it's something that's not really reported, but it's something that's, like, going on amongst a lot of people, and maybe it's not being reported because the people that know just kind of keep quiet about it, but just like how they, the, the, you know, they had, like, those congressional hearings over uh, steroids and baseball. Mm-hmm. There's no reason that shouldn't be going on in the wrestling industry right now. They they definitely should be because well, I mean, if it did, I feel because it's going to save the lives of a lot of pro wrestlers possibly. And as we've seen, a lot of these guys once they start hitting their 40s or 50s, they start dropping like flies. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know what? I said this in other interviews too. One of the reasons I decided to ask wrestlers about pro wrestler uh, about drug abuse in the industry when I was shooting the 101 Reasons was I was on PWInsider.com one day and um, uh, funny. Just, yeah just ironically I read on there um, like this day in history one of the Von Erichs died the same day in history as Mr. Perfect died but separated by about like 10 or 15 years or something like that yep. but it's like so ironic that a day in history of wrestling is known as the day two well like famous pro wrestlers died from drug abuse, you know, and that's one of the reasons that motivated me to ask that, and I still do ask that to certain wrestlers, uh, it's just, it's something in this business that, it, it, as fans, and as, like, you guys are, uh, radio reporters, and the internet reporters, it, it would be disrespectful of us to avoid that as a, as a situation, or as a news piece, because your favorite wrestler today could be dead next, next year, or, maybe even next month because he did too much coke or he did too many, uh, you know, steroids caused a heart attack, whatever. I mean, there's so many different things that could result in drug abuse. Right. And it just, it, it is something where a long time ago I was doing the forefront for a book that never got released for Ricky Steamboat. I was working with him and his wife, and I remember a line that he said to me. It was right after Hawk had died, and he's like, don't think that every one of us, Every one of us who were around in that era, we all look at each other and we all wonder, are we next? And that's pretty deep right there. But going back to the films, and you said you have another one coming out. Would you mind giving us a little um, insight on who might be appearing in that one? Um, all right. I haven't told anybody this, but I'll, like, I can tell you a few names. Um, I've been trying to keep this secretive, so I haven't told anybody, but in real, realistically, the DVD... But the documentary is going to be finished in about uh, two months, three months, I'm guessing. I pretty much have all footage shot now. It's just a matter of editing. I have um, I've, well, I've presented to TNA. It's going to be a more positive documentary. I'm calling it Pro Wrestling Dreams. And I did present to TNA because I have a bunch of their guys on footage. Like, you know, I, would you guys want to be involved in the documentary to an extent? Uh, supplying footage and also telling the story of you guys getting on Spike TV of television exposure nationally. So I haven't heard from them back yet. I actually faxed them, like, on Friday. I'm hoping that they come through. It would be it would be good for them and good for the, the documentary piece because just like Beyond the Mad, nobody knew how big it might have gotten at the time. Right. Like Hulk Hogan denied to be a part of it. Right. Uh, with this, I feel that this production, I, I honestly have 
in between about 20 to 25 pro wrestlers in it, the one I'm working on right now. And with TNA guys, I have uh, Chris Daniels, Petey Williams, Chris Sabin, uh, who else? Jeez, uh, I got so many. Sonny Siaki, um, uh, who else? There's somebody else I'm, I'm totally missing. Uh, AJ Styles, I got AJ in there. Wow. And AJ's like, man, that guy was so cool. He was so humble. Um, he's the, he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met in the business. I'll never forget one time he called me up. And he was standing, he just called me up because I guess I was the first number on his phone for whatever reason. And he's like, I had to call somebody. I'm standing in the room with some cross-dressing transsexuals, and I needed to call somebody to laugh about it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, just... so cool. AJ, put it this way. AJ uh, gave me his phone number after we interviewed in case I needed help promoting the DVD for, like, radio interviews or whatever. Well... I'm like, no pro wrestler has really ever done that. Like, really, like... Yeah, I'll help you promote the DVD if you need help. You know, I mean, that guy is so cool and so humble. He, I don't think uh, he got, there's enough nice words to say about him. He's, like, uh, just one of the most respectable and uh, sincere pro wrestlers you'll ever meet. And in this business, there's a lot of egos. And even, uh, man, there's even egos, like, they're, like, I'm out here in Southern California. I've met people who are, on, like, in the middle of the card that are indie jobbers in Southern California that are fucking... Oh, I'm sorry, I cursed right there. Don't worry, we'll censor it later. <laughs> okay. They are, uh, there, there's, there's a certain indie people who, you know, they have huge egos if they think they're Hulk Hogan. I'm not going to mention names or anything, but there's just some people that are just like inflatable egos that need to be popped to an extent. We're like, I'll go up to some guy who, I'll be like, hey, would you want to do an interview for the documentary? And I'll ask, like, there's one guy in particular I thought of. I asked him like two or three times. I didn't know much about him. I was just, Looking at like I'm doing him a favor and he's gonna be in my piece. Maybe I'll say something interesting. At the same time, some people who aren't familiar with him now might be familiar with him after the DVD. And you know, I just get turned down for like this interview, and I'm like, whoa, like you know, that's cool. I mean, I understand it, but then when I asked him again like a month later, he's like, no, I think I'll pass. Like it just, I, you know, I have a right to pass on it, but at the same time, it's like there's egos in this business, even at like the lowest levels. And to meet somebody like AJ, who's like been a champion, who's been on TNA, who's turned down a WWE contract. I mean, the guy could be anywhere in this business he pretty much wants to be, and he's just he just keeps his humbleness, his humbleness, and he's just a really good guy, you know. Yeah, it's funny that you mention that because we encounter that a lot ourselves doing interviews. It seems like the bigger names that we get are, you know, far more like reliable as far as doing interviews. Um, you know, are far more open and honest far more relaxed, um, you know, and just overall nicer guys where, you know, some of these indie guys, like you're saying, it's almost humorous. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? To think that maybe they don't understand the opportunity that people give them to be on, like, live radio or on a documentary um, or or just, like, maybe even nervous, don't know, you know, how, how to react to it. But it's very interesting to, to see because some of these people are in feds that you've never even heard of. Right. Like, I can mention, like, I can mention a couple names, like, some of them I'm friends with are cool, but there's, like, one or two guys in particular who just, like, would want to be in the documentary, even though this documentary is going to be really big. I mean, I have a ton of wrestlers, former WWE guys, legends, current TNA guys, and, like, here they are, just, like, some guy who's, like, losing to Joe Schmo in, like, some little, like, cafeteria in Southern California and they don't want to be in a documentary, I'm like, dude, like, I'm just trying to help you out, you know? Like, yeah. I, I, that's one of the things I know I have, like, kind of that, that special little ability or power to do with a documentary is I could take somebody who only wrestles indie shows in, say, Southern California, put them in a documentary, and now people all over the world, literally, in Australia, UK, Canada, uh, back east, and, uh, on the east coast of the United States, Germany, I mean, these DVDs go everywhere. Right who can always, you know, find out who this person is if they don't know who they already are. And that's amazing that people turn down things like that. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this question. Given all the big names we mentioned we had uh, on the program ourselves, yes, we had Diamond Dallas Page on Once Upon a Time, uh, Tylene Buck, uh, Sean O'Hare, all these guys, big names, Conan, these are all pretty big names, superstars, and the thing is selling like hotcakes. I saw that it was number one on one of the uh, top wrestling sales sites for quite some time. Let me just ask you, has any of them ever giving you a little grief about the fact that you're making a boatload of money off of their presence? Um, 
I don't know if they're so. Uh, you know what I mean? It, I wish I was making a buttload of money. Well, I said both, but that's okay. <laughs> boat, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I mean, the DVDs made money. Um, you know what? I haven't signed one distribution deal yet for the production. Uh, I'm kind of. I've been protective over that because the DVD business is really shady. But, anyways. Um, it's making good money, and I have already, I'm producing six to eight other DVDs right now off the revenue that I developed from 101 Reasons Not to Be a Pro Wrestler. So it's made me able to fund myself and my projects and pay my bills so I'm getting by. Am I rich off of this? No. But, you know, every sale that I get just goes towards me producing my next thing. Um, and some of the wrestlers, uh, you know, uh, and I haven't mentioned this before, but uh, DDP uh, threatened a lawsuit against me about, this was about a month and a half ago, a month ago, and I've pretty much kept quiet about it until now, but I'm not afraid to really talk about it. Uh, and DDP was just furious, man, furious, because like, he, he supposedly positive the page. So anyways, he uh, he didn't like being associated on the, uh, with the title is, 101 reasons not to be a pro wrestler, which some people can look at as being a negative title, even though I personally think it's a, a, an honest title. Right. So he was really upset, and he had contacted me and was furious, furious. I mean, I can't even use the words that, I, that, that he really said to me. Uh, there's, And I don't even want to say certain things to make him look bad, because I do respect him to an extent, still, even though I had this encounter with him. But... Uh, he had his lawyer get in contact with me. I gave uh, I faxed over his release form that I had signed to his lawyer, and there was nothing really uh, they can do. I mean, I have the right to use his identity in this video. And um, I've had other problems, too, where um, one pro wrestler, some indie guy, attacked me once. I was caught on camera. Um, he physically attacked you? Yeah, I got punched by him, and I ran. That was Baby Slim. You probably saw that. It, it was it was on my website. My website's getting changed right now. But, um, yeah, he attacked me, and to be honest with you, I've been banned from shooting footage at several indie shows, Result, uh, standing off of the past production, 101 Reasons. Certain indie feds won't let me shoot footage at their, at their shows anymore. Wow. Why do you believe that is? I mean, what what possibly could you do to damage their standings? No, I don't know. Uh, they're just. Uh, I, I, that's a good question. I don't know. Just I gotta believe a lot of it is based on the whole kind of. If you find out certain things about the wrestling business, it kind of can implicate a lot of people. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. uh, of the inner workings, and you know, some people are probably just protective of themselves as well as the others around them. Right. I mean, you I know think what? It's probably the best way to look at it. There, there was one said, uh, you guys might know who I'm talking about. I think the name is like Pro Wrestling Iron or Pro Wrestling something. I forget. Where like they got a big lawsuit filed against them for the death of one of their guys training at their camp. Uh huh. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, but they're out here in Northern California, I believe, and they're running a show in Southern California. So I contacted them, but, and I told them, yeah, I'm shooting a new documentary. It's positively based, called Pro Wrestling Dreams. And they uh, they were like, no, we don't want you at our show. We'd appreciate it if you don't show up. And um, I'm like, whoa. And they thought that like I was shooting footage of like interviewing about their lawsuit and everything that they had filed against them. And I made it clear to them as best as I could. Like, that's not where I'm going there. I'm going there to interview your wrestlers. I think Raven was going to be there that weekend. So I was like, I just want to interview Raven, maybe a couple other indie guys. And they were just like closed door. Um, and another group down here in Southern California, uh, they don't want. They they asked me not to come to the shows anymore. There was some kind of problem with people shooting clips of their shows, and I even offered that promotion the opportunity to be promoted in the documentary. Mm -hmm. And they uh, they were kind of open to it to an extent, but like there's so many people involved in the organization of the promotion where they couldn't they couldn't file things together to make it possible. So I mean, there's like so many there's egos and there's closed doors in this business, especially when you're trying to make a documentary. Absolutely. Well, once again, why don't you give the uh, website a plug and where people can pick this up, and I strongly suggest they do. I'm not just kissing ass. I, I never do. I, I'm the guy that told Ric Flair where to go. But anyway, back to the point. Just tell me uh, where can we pick this up, and what's the price, and what's the website address? Um, you can go to 
could go to hollymoodentertainment.com. That's Hollywood. Uh, it's like Hollywood, but the name of a W, Entertainment. So hollymoodentertainment.com, and just click on order online or order now. I forget what the nav button on the left says, but then uh, you just order through PayPal, and there's a mailing address on the website. It's easy to order. It's 19.99, and the DVD feature is like three hours long. And then you have another two hours of bonus footage, like about 45 minutes of the bonus footage, I assume, is uh, unedited answers of the wrestlers. So you get to see their whole answer instead of me editing it up. And, uh, you know, it's a fun production for everybody. And you get to see, uh, you didn't get to comment on this, uh, you got the, that New Jack match in there where he fights the old man, that, that 75-year-old guy. What do you think of that? Uh, New Jack's out there. i, I got to be honest with you. <laughs> if I was anybody in the business, whether I was very young or very old, I would not step in the ring with New Jack, given mass trans and all that craziness. Yeah, some wrestlers have told me they're like, you know what, I'll wrestle anybody in this business, but I'm scared of New Jack. Like, big, big pro wrestlers have told me that. And, like, that just says, if you order the DVD at HollywoodEntertainment.com, you'll see this match on there. It is the most, one of the most violent wrestling matches ever caught on video. You're gonna be amazed what New Jack will do to literally somebody who most of most of us are like between the ages of 16 to let's say 26 that are listening to your show. Right. Um, our grandparents. Imagine your grandfather or your grandmother going into the ring to fight New Jack, and New Jack beats your your grandfather with a baseball bat over the head. That's what you're gonna see. <laughs> it, is that, it is that disgusting. So. People love that match, though. I mean, that that match alone is worth the 19.99 to buy the DVD alone. I, I, that's what everybody tells me, at least. Yeah, he's a crazy guy. He's a crazy guy. I've had my uh, um, ups and downs with him in the past. If that's certain. He, if they, I think his exact quote was, "He wanted to. Uh, I think it was kill me, bring me back to life again, and then kill me again." <laughs> I was like, "Wow, good." <laughs> You know, it's uh, funny about uh, New Jack because the more people we interview, the more people say that he's an ass. <laughs> we yeah. just had a Devon on the show, and Devon's like, "Yeah, that guy's an asshole." Oh, he's yeah, like, you know, he's a nobody. Blah blah. blah. New Jack, if nothing else, maybe not the greatest wrestler, may not be the smartest guy in history, but he he never fails to at least incite a reaction. Yeah. New Jack hates the Dudleys, and now the Dudleys, for the first time since they're out of WWE, have the opportunity to fire back at him. To be honest with you, I don't think the Dudleys want to encounter New Jack in any any indie thing. They probably ask the promoters, and I'm just guessing here, I do not know, but they probably ask the promoters, is, is New Jack going to be on this show or anything like that? Because New Jack has, like, literally gone public with physically threatening their lives, you know? Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, once again, that's 101 reasons not to be a professional wrestler. Now, like we, you've said several times, the title might sound like it's really negative. The the thing really isn't. It just points out some parts of the business that really are not positive, but it's not a negative piece. You know, wrestling sucks or anything. It's really a good piece, and I hope people go out do and uh, do pick it up. Yeah, cool. Thank you. And you can get that at hollymoodentertainment.com. And I just want to thank you guys for helping promote the DVD and, like, getting this out to the public because, you know, this is something that, like, Vince McMahon's not going to make a documentary like this. No, he's not. He's gonna, yeah, and, like, it's, it's up to, like, independent people like myself and, like, others out there that are wrestling fans that have the camera and the equipment and the access to make something like this happen to make it happen. And, if, like, if I could in, inspire or motivate just one of your listeners to pick up a camera and start doing what I'm doing, in the end, like, five years from now, maybe definitely ten years from now, if we bring certain issues to the public eye and the wrestling fans' eyes, maybe we could save some wrestlers' lives or wrestlers could form a union. There's so many different things that need to be changed in this business, so I hopefully, you know, videos like this help make that happen. Yo, this is New Jack, and uh, you're listening to the Interactive Interview. Hi, this is Ivory from WWE, and you're listening to the Interactive Interview. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you enough. And now... Wow, that was nutty. <laughs> hey, we're back here on the Wrestling Up Center. We got a little bit of time here. We're going to try and haul through this SmackDown results ASAP. The show kicked off with Booker T coming out. He's obviously going to take on Christian in a match as they have a little ongoing feud. Charmel Sullivan was there. Booker T gets the win via a roll-up in this match. It's good to see Sul Christian at least is getting on TV if they're not going to push him, nothing else. You know Can what I'm you saying? dig it, sucker? 
We then go to the back. Eddie's looking sick. Theodore Long asked him, what is wrong? Eddie said he felt fine, but now he had a little cramp. I don't know. Yada, yada, yada. This will get interesting a little bit later on as we breeze through these results. Interesting. We see Edward Heinrich coming out for their match. They're next. Of course, they're taking on uh, Eminem, if I'm not mistaken, in, in this one. Oh, no, no. They're two jobbers. On, uh, yeah, Jared Steele and Anthony Coletti. Two jobbers. Probably two guys you're big fans of. Yeah. And what a rush. They get the quick win. LOD, 2005. Woo. Hey, we saw we see uh, Sylvan Greener. Sil Sylvan Greener, Sylvan Greener. There we no, go. Sylvan Greener in the back getting massage. She tells Chrissy that she is uh, fake, and that uh, Stacy's been shopping at the uh, Salvation Army. Kind of funny stuff here. Bob Holly comes in. He says hi to uh, Sylvia, and uh, obviously this is going to set up a match with uh, Sylvan taking on Bob Holly. I think Sylvan and Sylvia need to get together. Yeah, Bob Holly gets the win on this one. Uh, moving right along. We have a commercial break. We see what happens last week with Randy Orton and The Undertaker. Cowboy Bob Orton comes out. He introduces the legend killer, Randy Orton. Question for you, Chuck. Yes. Why the hell does Randy Orton need a mouthpiece? I don't know. I mean, Bob Orton's not what I would call necessarily a great mouthpiece. In fact, he kind of talks slow and a little bit retarded. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I'd have him as my mouthpiece, but then again, I'm Chuck D. I don't need a mouthpiece. Why don't we go back? You just need a body. No, we saw Ken Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy come out to the ring. He Kennedy! The mic, tells uh, the chim, Tony Kennedy. Chimble, to uh, get the hell out of the ring. Mysterio comes out, and uh, this is oddly enough right here. Mysterio gets the win over Mr. Kennedy. That's not true. Yeah. No. No, no, I, I mean Kennedy. Yeah, right, right. Kennedy gets the win on Mysterio with his top rope spinning movie thing. Isn't that ridiculous? They just spent all that this time tremendous. building up Mysterio with this huge feud with Eddie Guerrero, and then he just goes and beats Mysterio. I am a huge Kennedy fan. I think it's tremendous. I think he's got a great gimmick. He's a fantastic worker. That finisher is sick. I loved it. Hey, I'm, you know about the I'm, a, I'm a Kennedy fan myself. I've always been a Kennedy fan. Uh, I'm a big fan of Democrats. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> we go to the back. We see uh, Raw Replay. Blah, blah, blah. Bischoff will face Cena. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Eddie Guerrero decides to uh, have a nurse help him, courtesy of Batista. The uh, nurse turns out to be a gay guy. And Eddie Guerrero gets a gay guy. some things stuck up his butt. Very interesting. Not the greatest <laughs> TV I've seen. But, uh, yeah. Woo! Simon System coming out. Feels great. And he's going to face newcomer Bobby Lachey. That guy is phenomenal. Monty Brown, take a back seat. This guy has got it. What does Monty Brown have to do with this? He looks like Monty Brown. Okay, I thought we were the talking about The guy looks Smackdown. exactly like Monty hey, Brown. Hey, why don't we try something here, Mr. Walsh? Yeah. It's called you staying on topic. What do you I think? I am staying on topic. Yeah, it's good. This guy is, Thank you for shopping. This guy's Come again. Thank you for shopping. Come again. Okay. Then we see uh, Chris Benoit winning again. 49.8 seconds. That's great. I'm thrilled. That's hey. a good dusty finish right there, dude. It was. Congratulations, Dusty Road. You're now on SmackDown. Now. Woo! Coming back from commercial break, we see Eminem come out to the ring. Batista and Guerrero come out. Uh, good match. Batista does better and better every week. Uh, obviously, Batista is going to pick up the win along with Eddie Guerrero. Looks like these guys are headed for a feud uh, sooner rather than later, in my opinion. Uh, obviously, we saw Batista kind of, you know, joking with Eddie Guerrero throughout the night where uh, Batista had him set up with that doctor, gave him a rectal exam. <laughs> Not my idea of good TV, but nonetheless, that's what happened. I think it's funny. Hey, you know what I mean? What do you give SmackDown overall? I tell you what, I like these new kids that are bringing in. I think that's really a good addition to the show. I'm going to go ahead and give it a 7 out of 10. Hey, you know what? I'm going to say I'm going to give it a, a, a 4 out of 10. Wow. Not a very good show, a little bit light on action, in my opinion. Backstage segment weren't that good. That new guy, I don't Smack know Smackdown's just treading water right now, man. I'll I tell you this much. I got to tell you this much, okay? Yeah, you got about 20 seconds, so you better make it fast. I'll tell you this much. His name sucks. His look is phenomenal. And what he did... To Simon Diamond, Simon Dean, apologize, was phenomenal. He just destroyed him. And I think this newcomer, whatever his name is, Shelby, or whatever the hell his name is, is going to be a star. He just needs a name change. Here's the deal, guys. We're going to go to a quick commercial break. We're going to come back with J.J. Dillon interview, one of the original Four Horsemen. And then we're going to talk a little bit of TNA. we got callers already on. So make sure you keep it locked right here to the wrestling up center on the blaze. The blaze 1260 AM is on the World Wide Web at theblaze1260.com. Listen to the blaze online. Check out our concert calendar. And so much more. Theblaze1260.com. ASU's original online alternative. And JJ, how you doing? James and Chuck, how are you today? 
Doing really well. Man, pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Doing real well. It's great to have another Jersey boy on the phone as well. Yeah, there were few and far between, it seems. In the wrestling business, anyway, yeah. Wrestling business. All right. So we heard you have a book out, and we put that up on the forums that you have a book out. And a lot of our um, private messages and instant messages that came in from the fans are asking where can they buy the book because they don't see it on Amazon. So why don't you let us know right off the bat where they can pick this up? Well, it's a, it's a project that was self-published, and my co-author, Scott Teal, uh, has a, a publishing company of his own called Crowbar Press, and, and Scott uh, published Ole Anderson's book. So he's uh, had some experience. And he has his own website, but maybe to simplify it, if you go to uh, J.J. Dillon, D-I-L-L-O-N.com, J.J. Dillon.com, which is my own personal website that's been up for two to three years, uh, and that was recently revamped by Scott Teal, and there's lots of old pictures and uh, information on there regarding my career. But right at the top, when you, when you first click on, you'll see... Wrestlers are like seagulls, like the spine of a book, and it says click here. And if you click there, it automatically takes you to uh, Scott's website and brings you up on the page uh, with my autobiography, Wrestlers Are Like Seagulls. And you can get a synopsis of the book. You can see what the cover looks like. Uh, he's got chapter headings. He's got a breakdown of, of what the content of each chapter is. There's, a, there's an index, so you can see some of the names that are mentioned. And also there's... Uh, separate section there, review and comment, and I would suggest that uh, anybody interested maybe go to review and comments and, and see some of those that have been posted by people that have uh, already ordered the book. So it's only available right now uh, through mail order, and you get the information on there, or I've been doing some of these reunion shows, which unfortunately for your listeners have been primarily on the East Coast, mm -hmm. and uh, I do plan go to the next Cauliflower Alley, which would be in Vegas, uh, but that's not until June of next year, so I'm hoping that your listeners will not want to wait that long and uh, will go on and, and get the information, and I can assure you that, that this book is worth the effort of seeking out and worthy of a read. Absolutely. Right. Let me ask you this. We're going to get back to more in-depth questions about the book just a little bit later on in this interview, but I want to know this. How did you initially get involved in this crazy business of professional wrestling? Well, it's, uh, it's really quite simple. Uh, I was a 14-year-old kid living in Trenton, New Jersey, and back in those days we had more TV choices probably in, the, in that area because Trenton was nestled halfway between, well, actually closer to Philly than New York, but so that we could actually get uh, television signals from both major cities. And I discovered uh, wrestling on Thursday night from the Capitol Arena in Washington, D.C. with Ray Morgan, and uh, I was hooked. I was a fan, and I, I continue to be a fan to this day. But I just decided at that time of my life that uh, this is what I wanted to do. And I chased the dream, and like a lot of other dreams, there were a lot of hurdles and obstacles along the way. And I actually did just about everything imaginable from sell programs as a young kid to be able to get into the arena to see the matches, to uh, help tear the ring down when somebody didn't show up and they, uh, they had trouble uh, storing the ring. And, uh, I've been a ring announcer at one time and the uh, ring second in the corner. Uh, and actually, uh, my first time in the ring was actually as a referee, and I refereed for about six years with the commission in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, primarily in eastern Pennsylvania. Finally made the transition into the ring, and mm -hmm. I did that part-time for a couple of years and got my first full-time uh, booking with Jim Crockett Promotions, and of course at that time was Jim Crockett Sr., and that was in the early part of 1971 at a time when I was months from my 29th birthday, so I was not a kid, and uh, just I was determined that I was not going to give up, and I think that's part of the message of my book, Whether because I started from the mid-50s when names like Argentina Rock and Carl Von Hess and Skull mm -hmm. Murphy and Bruce Bernard and Chief Big Heart um, and Bobo Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, the Sheik, these were big names in that era, and I was a part of the business through that era of the early television stars to the old territory days, which is primarily what I worked 
through uh, mostly the south and the west. Uh, I went to Australia and Japan and Europe, and so I traveled all over, and I was uh, in the business, of course, when cable television came along that really dramatically changed the, the playing field, and, and I witnessed uh, what that effect was on, on wrestling, and eventually it came down to two major players, and Vince McMahon ultimately won out, and Ted Turner's company went belly up and then bought what little was left of it, which was primarily the, the old video rights. And right. So I saw really the, the whole history of what is modern wrestling from the early 50s right up to the time that uh, WCW went out of business in, in 2001, and I did so from a very unique perspective of primarily being on the inside through all of this. Absolutely. Well, let me give you this question. We just had Hulk Hogan on the show, and this really intrigued me because he was talking about how the young guys in the business, they don't listen with their heart. And you mentioned that you did everything to get into the business from being a referee to ring announcing to, I'm sure you set up rings in your day. You you did everything to get involved, and that's something you really don't see today. You see these guys, they go straight to a school, and then two months later they're out there at an indie event. And do you think that maybe the lack of the paying your dues, so to speak, is um, – is damaging the business in any way? Uh, I'm sure you could, on an individual basis, make that case. I mean, you could go back prior to that and, and make the case even when business was really, really good. There were some that will, will look at uh, somebody like Goldberg, who had a football career and blew out his knee. His football career was over, and he signed a deal at the power plant at WCW and got a crash course in wrestling, and because of the, the tremendous need for talent, got pushed out there, I'm sure probably way before he was, was ready. He had never done any interviews. He really never had any uh, significant number of matches. Uh, but he had that, what we like to call it, in quotes, and certainly Hulk Hogan had it. Right. There's something that people are drawn to. And unfortunately, Hulk Hogan paid his dues and had the ability to, to take it be able to maximize and unfortunately for for Bill Goldberg uh, the more exposure that he had uh, the more it exposed his lack of experience and he never really got an, a, a chance to, to get that experience so it's not it's not a knock on Bill Goldberg but somebody could make the uh, the claim there that that maybe Bill didn't pay his dues mm -hmm. but I uh, I think you have to look at it on a on a person to person basis and I had a personal experience recently where I was at a dinner honoring Bruno San Martino at a reunion up in uh, King of Prussia, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Mm. And I don't want anybody in trouble, the Dudley boys. I don't think we can call them the Dudley boys anymore, but uh, <laughs> they were the, the team formerly known as the w Dudley boys were there. And I uh, met them for the first time, and they spoke at the same dinner that I did honoring Bruno that was part of the weekend. And, of course, Dominic DiNucci, that's an old, old name, and a friend of Bruno's was there, as was Mick Foley and Terry Funk, and I spoke, and the Dudley spoke. And I was uh, pleasantly surprised at how humble they were, that they paid homage to the, to the veterans were there, and the fact that they, they stated, you know, you, you were the guys that paved the way for us. And I've had a chance to watch them perform, and they're doing things that we would never have dreamed of doing. <laughs> Um, the athleticism uh, is, is there as well, but I was very impressed with them. So there is at least one example of somebody modern day that's star status that really has that, that uh, respect for the business. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, we had an opportunity to sit down with uh, Devon maybe two, three weeks ago, and we had him on the phone for nearly two hours, and he was just so down to earth, and as he said, so humble and really well-spoken and, and, and did, in fact, you know, speak highly uh, of a lot of, you know, the, the wrestlers past that came before them and helped, you know, pave the way, so to speak, for them. I will say this. The, the, the thing that got me the most respect for them was he was talking about the comparison between them and the Road Warriors, and instead of saying, you know, what most of the guys, what I would assume the business would be saying, you know, well, we did it this, we did it now, what have they done lately, or something offensive like that. They were like, well, we don't have any problem being number two to them in the history books. Mm. And I thought that was very respectful. Yeah, that's, a, that's a class response. Because really the toughest, toughest test, and I don't care if you're talking about uh, professional football, basketball, baseball, professional wrestling, the toughest test is the test of time. Mm -hmm. And people like the Road Warriors and the 
Four Horsemen, Ric Flair, and Harley Race, and Dory Funk, Terry Funk, every one of these these people, Mick Foley, Evel, and Roddy Piper. I mean, I could go on and on and on. I don't mean to slight anybody by not mentioning a name, but mm-hmm. every one of these people has, has withstood the test of time, and that that is really the biggest biggest test of all. And the Dudleys, uh, to ask that question, you know, you might have to wait 10 years now and then ask that question. <laughs> but, absolutely. Well, you've seen, as you said, so many so many changes in the business, but you've also seen so many colorful characters in the business. Is there any, I'm sure the book is chock full of them, but is there any um, people that you've met over the course of the years that stand out as just such unique characters and, and funny characters, and do you have any funny stories that you're willing to share with us? Uh, well, I could tell you, you know, uh, that there are a lot of great stories in the book. It's not a, uh, uh, it's certainly not an expose. It's it's written basically out of character, uh, with great honesty. And um, when I started as a referee, uh, I was in college, and Vince McMahon Sr., who is Vincent J. McMahon, uh, was a head of of what was then the WWE, which was a regional promotion that ran. And it was the biggest in the world because it went from the tip of Maine down to Washington, D.C., and as far west as, I think, uh, probably Pittsburgh. And you could just imagine the, the population. There's probably as much population just in that area as there would be in the whole rest of the country put together. But I worked for Vince's father, uh, knew him on a personal uh, level to be able to speak to. He was very kind and gracious to me at a time when I was really a nobody. Mm-hmm. And uh, from there... Uh, the end of my career, of course, uh, along the way I worked almost uh, eight years for Vince Jr., which is uh, Vincent K. McMahon, and I was the vice president of talent relations with what was then Titan Sports. So I followed Pat Patterson, and then uh, after me, Jim Ross uh, had that position, as well as Jim was uh, an on-air announcer, too. So I, I, I don't know how he did it like he did all those years, and, and of course, that's a position currently held by... Uh, by John Laurinaitis, but I mean, I've seen it all through uh, through that period of time. And yes, I, I've seen lots of characters, whether you know, the Sheik, uh, Red Dog Maine, Abdullah the Butcher. Uh, and I can't really say that there is one particular name that that uh, you know that really jumps out at me. Uh, uh, just uh, there, there are very few that say that I didn't meet, didn't didn't interact with throughout my career because it spanned. Uh, almost 40 years and mm-hmm. over a period of five decades. Hmm. Well, while we're talking about all the people you've had the pleasure of interacting with over the course of your career, I mean, you've had some matches with the Road Warriors, the Andres of the Giants, the, the, the Dick Murdochs. Who in your mind gave you, you know, some of the best matches overall during your uh, time wrestling? Well, certainly any time that you would say that you were in the ring with Andre the Giant would be a memorable occasion, and I was in a handicap match with the Mongolian Stomper against Andre in a, in a, a big extravaganza, uh, Ganza, which was in Texas Stadium. They had the ring set up uh, on the end zone, and of course all the seats down that end of the horseshoe were filled, so that was certainly a, a memorable occasion. Uh, I had a, a run with Dick Murdoch when I was actually active as a wrestler throughout the West Texas area that... Um, you know, probably some of the, the, the greatest matches that I ever had in my career. And prior to that, there was a name that may not be familiar to your listeners. Uh, there was a promotion up in the Maritimes of Canada in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and there was a guy up there named Leo Burke. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was probably as good as anybody in the business and had great matches with him. Um, I wrestled Tito Santana the only time that I ever wrestled Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. So that's a memorable occasion. And I, and uh, I actually, uh, on one occasion, wrestled the original El Santo in a tag match in El Paso, Texas. Mm-hmm. So, Giant Baba, uh, he stands out. I mean, they're just, they're, they're, there's so many that I've faced uh, throughout my career. And again, there's not, there's not one particular match that, that really jumps, jumps out. The one match that I probably remember more than anybody was a guy named Alan Martin, who I wrestled on TBS on the Saturday right prior to the war games at the Omni in Atlanta when uh, the Road Warriors uh, demolished my shoulder and put me off for about six weeks. But 
I, I still have a tape of that match, and <laughs> Tully Blanchard was there, Ric Flair was there, Lex Luger was there, Arn Anderson was there, and uh, towards the end of the show, uh, I actually wrestled on, on the program and took each of the signature moves of the guys that I was managing and applied them to Alan Martin, and it was uh, it was a very entertaining, tongue-in-cheek type of match that really set the foundation for <laughs> Uh, for the war games, and uh, as crazy as it sounds, it, it was one of the matches that uh, I have some of the fondest memories of. <laughs> well, most of us have quite fond memories of you as part of, of course, the, as many people see it, I'm not, well, I do as well, the premier heel faction history, rest, the history of wrestling, the four horsemen, easy for me to say. Um, why don't you uh, let us know, what, how did that all come to be? How did you end up all paired together? Because it was some of the most elite performers in the history of professional wrestling all paired together in one faction. You know, it was a very spontaneous thing, uh, James and Chuck. I would love to tell uh, everybody on Wrestling Epicenter that this was a major production that we had you know, plotted out for six months and then you know, it was executed uh, beyond our wildest uh, dreams. But it was really a spontaneous thing that took place. Uh, we were doing TV every week uh, on a Saturday morning, and uh, the horsemen would be up at night, uh, Norfolk, Richmond, Philly, wherever the town was, and knowing that we had to get a flight very early in the morning into Atlanta to be able to tape a couple hours of TV that aired that night at 6. But uh, the horsemen were the horsemen, and uh, Ric Flair is the real deal, deal, and we used to go out on the town and get in late, not have enough, uh, enough sleep or as much sleep as we should have had, get on a plane, go to Atlanta, and that was some of the probably the best television uh, that, we, that we ever did because we had to get on a plane, and, and usually Saturday night was a major night for wrestling, and, and whether it was Detroit, Cleveland, or Memphis, or wherever we would go to that night. But on this particular morning, because sometimes we had an hour and a half show, and uh, a lot of times it was live to tape, and, and we would, you know there would be time that, would be short we'd have to fill and at that time I was only managing Tully Blanchard and of course mm -hmm. Rick Flair was the world champion Tully was either the national champion or TV champion I, I, I'm not really, really sure mm -hmm. and of course Ole and Arn were the tag team champions so we had all the belts all the bragging rights and I think there was some time that and somebody said well all of you go out you know we all went out together and the idea is that we would uh, you know all feed off of Flair who was as the world champion, the, you know, the person that we all paid homage to. And it was just a spontaneous thing because in the middle of it, when somebody handed the mic to Arn Anderson, Arn said, you know, take a good look at your TV screen because uh, never have so few uh, wreak so much havoc uh, in anything since the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and, hung, and held up four fingers. Hmm. And it was a spontaneous thing that the, the horseman thing, when the next time one or all of us came back out, the fans were yelling, horseman, horseman, and putting up four fingers. And that's how it all got started, and it just grew from there. And we've been lucky enough to have Ric Flair, Clay Bransford, and, and now yourself on the program. We're, we're almost there, man. we got one more to go. we got them all. <laughs> well, you know what's great, too, because I go to these reunions and, you're talking 20 years ago. You're talking mid-80s, and it's mm -hmm. very gratifying to have fans from all over the country, from all over the world, uh, all across Canada, uh, you know, come to Charlotte or come to King of Prussia or come to Tampa, Florida or wherever we've gone and bring their children in many cases and bring old pictures and programs and magazines and, um, you know, ask you to sign them and take a picture with them and, you know, they talk about specific matches or specific arenas or specific uh, angles. And it's uh, very gratifying that 20 years after the fact that these people still have this, you know, burned in their mind. And that tells me that we really must have done something right. And, and like I said earlier, uh, we stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. And you actually uh, somewhat changed the business in a way because I remember watching as a kid, seeing you guys do the thing where you guys beat up Dusty backstage and, that really was, as far as I can recall, one of the first backstage, so, quote-unquote, vignettes, which has pretty much filled the entire show these days. Yeah, we, uh, we attacked Dusty outside the parking lot of Jim Crockett Promotions. And the difference is that uh, it was all shot with one camera. Mm -hmm. And if you ever get a hold of a tape and look back at it, 
uh, as it started, we were sitting there off to the side of the road watching traffic go by, and the camera picked up as it's looking at the traffic, you know, the instructions about, hey, you know, you keep shooting this camera no matter what you see, and you may not like it, but you're not a part of it, but you're being paid good money to shoot it. <laughs> and so that established why the camera was there. And then uh, we followed Dusty once his car went by into the parking lot and, and blocked him off where he couldn't get out. And basically it was uh, a mob scene where we ganged up on him, beat him up pretty good. And some, uh, some of the uh, language was beat uh, where his hand was hit while I mean, it was hogtied to a truck. It was kind of digitized so that you could just imagine how bad it, it might have looked. And we further covered it because... When the announcers came on, Tony Schiavone and David Crockett, you know, they had this very disgusted look on their face, and we were uh, uh, very clear about the fact that they had to air it because we had purchased the television time. <laughs> so it justified why the camera was there, why it was shown, and I think that's what's lost in the modern-day thing, that you have two guys whispering to each other as if they're the only two people in the whole world, and how do you explain that that camera is just inches from somebody's face? Except very, very fair point. But let's talk about managers. Of course, you were one of the managers of the Four Horsemen, and we really don't see male managers anymore. Uh, in the days of Bobby Heenan and all those classic men of Jimmy Hart and the great wizard, Grand Wizard, and all those guys, they're not around anymore. There's no male managers to take their place. Do you think that maybe something is missing by not having that element in professional wrestling these days? Well, I, I definitely think so. And you mentioned Bobby Heenan, and I always have felt and still do that Bobby Heenan is the greatest wrestling manager of all time. and he's the, uh, He set the standard by which the rest of us uh, are measured. Bob, Bobby could do it all. He's a very, very talented guy. <laughs> but the business has changed. Um, the, the, the manager filled a void with some of the characters that either looked great, were great performers in the ring, but somehow lacked the, uh, the interview skills or some of them possibly had the interview skills, but their physical look was such that if they talked, it just kind of, you know, took something away from it. And when you, looking at the New York territory, when you had Fred Blassie and you had the Grand Wizard uh, and, and you had the managers that were up there, it was also a catalyst for a new talent coming in to get over that much faster. Because when a, when a wrestler came in who they weren't familiar with, but they saw he was immediately managed by Classy Freddy Blassie or the Grand Wizard, uh, right away the assumption was, well, this guy must really be something special or he wouldn't be his manager. Mm. So the manager had a, a function on, on many levels, but the business has changed so much. that The, the big problem is the, the, the business today is star for talent. Wrestling is a talent-driven business. Uh, no different than any other form of entertainment. Uh, when you uh, listen to a song on the radio, it could be the number one song for three months, six months, whatever, but no matter how great a song it is or how much you enjoy listening to it, there comes a point when you say, oh, after every third airplay, I, can't, I don't want to hear that song again. I want to hear something else. And the same thing with wrestling talent. No matter how great you are, how talented you are, how exciting your program is it reaches a point where the fans just chew you up and they start looking elsewhere to say well we're ready for something new and in the old territory days or even when wcw was still active there were other places where young wrestlers were getting a chance to wrestle every night in front of a live crowd in front of television cameras and eventually vince mcgrann was able to cherry pick the better ones and bring them uh to his promotion because he had the, the machinery to uh, pay them better with all of the uh, uh, licensing and merchandising agreements that he had in place. And by Vince putting everybody out of business, uh, I always draw a parallel to, to baseball because I'm a big baseball fan. And mm -hmm. It's like if uh, the minor league system ceased to exist, you, you wouldn't notice it maybe for the first couple of years. But eventually when you didn't have players with the skills that, at the major league level that you're accustomed to seeing, then the major league game would suffer, and that's what ha what's happened with professional wrestling. You, you well, cannot, I, I a, you can't, you can't wrestle question. one, two days a week uh, or, uh, or once a month and not be on television and hone your skills to the level to be able to compete where we did. 
definitely. I, I've got a little bit of a parallel question for you. Um, in my personal opinion, it seems like maybe, yeah, there's a little bit lack of talent right now. But I kind of feel like there's enough talent out there and that the WWE is just kind of trimming the rosters, you know, a little bit too small, so we're forced to see the same guy so often. Do you feel like there's any maybe truth to that or that plays a role um, in the current state of the business at all? Oh, I'm, I'm sure there is some validity to that, too. And, um, again, it's, there's, it's a business decision, too, because the, the, the most risk and the least return on the dollar is the live event. And, I mean, it's like everything else, the cost of everything is going up from gas to insurance to what have you, and people travel less. They have less uh, 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 dollars to go out and, and spend outside of their uh, basic needs. And so the live events have become fewer and fewer, uh, and they, they now concentrate at the, at the WWE on the televised and pay-per-view events. So that means there's less chances for guys to go work and to get experience, and so the roster gets cut back, and it's just it's just like a, a vicious cycle, almost like going down the toilet. Mm. Yeah. Another thing that I notice is we talk a lot about the territory days, and of course when there was territories, a guy would get injured or something would happen to the baby face and he'd go away and you wouldn't see him for a little while and then he'd come back for the revenge on the heel but in that time he would just go into another territory and these days you just have the guys that are on TV each and every week they get beat up and they're back the next week right and unfortunately because of uh, modern media there is nowhere to, where to go I mean in the old days guy, a guy could uh, get booked in Japan and be gone for four weeks six weeks and um uh, people wouldn't realize that he was on a on a, a tour of Japan, but now the internet is is truly uh, international, and you got fans all over the world. That when somebody pops up, they immediately know it. So it changed all the ground rules, and it, it made it a lot tougher. Hmm. Well, let's go back to your your days behind the scenes, and this really interests me more than anything in WCW, especially. But let's just go uh, rush through your WWE days, which were quite a few years. You were working for Vince McMahon. What were some of your job titles under the WWE moniker, or WWE banner? Well, when I first went there, uh, the World Wrestling Federation was was doing two different syndicated program. There was the Superstars and Challenge that were taped like every third week. Mm -hmm. And in some major mar in fact, in most major markets, both shows uh, aired at, at different times, and there was actually a third show where there was some crossover in, in markets, so there wasn't too much duplication. But on the nights when they didn't have television, they were running three live events. And at those days, there were maybe six matches on the card, one tag, and... Uh, as business uh, suffered, uh, they thought, well, we'll go from three ta towns to two town and strengthen the cards in, in the two towns. Uh, but then instead of six matches, there were eight matches. And then when it went to one town, uh, you're into a situation almost like you are today where you, it's not uncommon to have 11, 12, 13 matches on the card and 30 guys. And because of that, uh, the guys that are on the card uh, – They've, they've basically really forgotten the whole basic concept of what professional wrestling is all about. And the teachers who had the ability to show them are, are fewer and fewer. They've either gotten out of the business or, you know, we've lost some. Uh, uh, somebody like Kurt Henning, tragically, through uh, mm. uh, an early death. So the business has changed. So when I went there to answer your question, they were about booking three towns a night, and Vince McMahon has always been the booker, and Pat Patterson was helping him, and they needed help and recruited me, and I went in there and strictly walked off camera with uh, WCW, which was just forming at that point, making the transition from Jim, Jim Crockett Promotions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I retired and, and strictly was on the creative side of writing the TVs, taking care of the house shows. And in those days, they were only doing four or five major pay-per-views a year, and uh, from there, I made the transition into uh, talent relations, which is really handling all the personal appearances, uh, the logistics of the travel, 
even when it was three towns, it was it was one challenge. But when it got down to one town where you had 25, 30 guys on the card, you still had uh, the same problem of trying to move people around and be cost effective. So, uh, and I was involved with uh, with the new talent coming in, was sitting down with Vince uh, when he would meet with him and and determine if he wanted to uh, to offer him an opportunity and. That's where, unfortunately, I think the first time I met Nick Foley, I got off on the wrong foot with him because he, at the time, didn't get hired the first time he came up there and had a perception that somehow I blocked it or um, you know was not in favor of him coming on board, which, of course, was not the case. But a lot of guys didn't understand that, and it was only years later that I sat down, which has just been a couple years ago, with Nick Foley and told him how it really was. and. As a result, uh, I've grown really close with uh, with Mick, and he understands. He's a very, very bright man, a very talented man, and he finally understood that uh, Vince basically takes credit for everything that's good, and never takes the blame for anything that's either unpleasant or negative or not good. <laughs> that was basically my role was to be the uh, the fall guy, so good the guy. Fall guy or the guy that uh, deflected all the heat for anything and everything, wow. including including payoffs. Uh, if I did payoffs with Vince and told him that Randy Savage, uh, I thought meant more on that card and, and should get more compensation, and Vince would say no. But when the phone would ring uh, a few days later and Randy Savage would say, "I'm very disappointed in my payoff. I thought I meant more on the card." And Vince would say, well, let me take a look at it again. And I'd take the payoff sheets in with him. He'd look at it. And the next conversation with Randy would be, you know, I think you're right. I don't know what J.J. was thinking. Wow. And believe me, that happened. I, I, I believe your word like gospel, man. I trust you. But let me ask you this question here. Uh, why did you leave the WWE? Did that have anything to do with it? Or did you were you used to it by that point? Uh, Vince McMahon is very difficult to work for. Not that uh, uh, that I would say that I gave up. I've worked for difficult people, you know, at various times in my life. But there were there were several factors. I uh, the business can be tough on 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 your personal life. I was married three times and divorced three times. Uh, my last marriage, after I retired, I I had young children. I had uh, twins when I was 50 years old. That uh, have a birthday coming up this coming Tuesday and my twins are going to be 13 years old and I have another baby that just turned 11 and I was worried about their future and supporting them and after the steroid trial uh, where Vince spent five million dollars in legal fees mm, to so become acquitted um, he didn't take and, and cut salaries for all management in the company which uh, I could have lived with something like that if he just said, you know, all my upper management takes a 5% cut to turn the company around. And he, he picked uh, a handful of people that had a quote-unquote wrestling background, such as myself and Pat Patterson and Jerry Briscoe and Jim Ross and Howard Finkel and Lord Al Hayes and cut salaries anywhere from 25 to 40%. And in my case, because uh, uh, I was at a higher level, it meant a 40% cut for me and, and like everybody else I had bought a home and obligated myself to a, a mortgage you know based on a, the commitment that Vince made to me and between a Friday and a Monday uh, my salary was cut 40 percent and uh, that eventually led to me after I left there having to declare a bankruptcy so I always made the statement and if you read wrestlers like seagulls I told the whole story in there and that if it was just a matter of me I could survive because I've been a survivor all my life if I had to live in a phone booth. But the minute that you threaten taking the food off the table of my children, then that's something that uh, uh, I have a hard time forgiving you for. And I told Vince the day that I resigned that I had lost all personal respect for him and, and professional respect. And the day that I sold my house, which took me a year and a half, uh, I told him I couldn't work for him one more day and walked out the door. Wow. Well, let me ask you this, though, as much as Vince may have uh, done you wrong there. What did you think of the differences backstage at WCW compared to the way WWE was run? Was there a big lapse or, or a difference in professionalism? Uh, Vince um, gave me an opportunity to go there, and the day that I resigned, I thanked him for that opportunity. And to this day, uh, uh, I admit I 
I never stopped growing my whole time in the business, and for the time that I worked for Vince McMahon, I learned a tremendous amount, especially about television and about a lot of the details. And I went from a situation with Crockett Promotions in the beginning of WCW where a handful of people, and I would have been one of the key people, had many, many jobs to do to, to keep the thing afloat. And when you got to the uh, World Wrestling Federation at that point, which was Titan Sports, where I wore ten hats, hats there were ten people each who had a full-time job doing what I used to do. And, of course, they did their job much better. It was much more complex because it was a much bigger operation. And uh, I think you used the key word. It was, it was run professionally. It certainly was. Hmm. Let me ask you this. We've had uh, both major players. This is uh, looking at the backstage history of WCW a little bit more. Uh, from the Starcade 1997 uh, main event on the phone was thing. We discussed it in great detail with Hogan, unfortunately. We just kind of brushed over it um, due, due to some time constraints. So let me ask you, what happened that night with, with uh, the, the screw-up finish? And do you feel, as I do, that it was one of probably the first major blows to WCW? Uh, refresh my memory now. What particular match were you referring to? This was uh, Sting Hogan, where the finish was obviously should have been Sting beats the crap out of Hogan, since that's what they were leading for for a year and a right. half. And it ended up being Hogan gets the pin, and everybody's confused. I uh, I don't have a specific recollection of everything that led up to it, but I and what happened that night. But I can tell you this: that there is a tremendous amount of politics in wrestling, the same as there is in all facets of life, no matter where you work or what you do. Uh, and Hulk Hogan was always a master politician that uh, really knew how to take care of himself and take care of his career. The big difference at WCW is that Vince McMahon ran his company, I don't want to say with an iron fist, but close to an iron fist, and he had control of all aspects of it. And if he didn't have control of you, and if you weren't in sync with what his plans were and where he wanted to go, he always had the philosophy that, that his company or the World Wrestling Federation brand, which is now the WWE, was greater than any one individual, and that included Hulk Hogan. And unfortunately, at WCW, the feeling was the inmates running the asylum. There was not that strong control there, and with Eric Bischoff, they just basically ran over the top of him, and they soon realized that when they would come to him crying and squawking, all he would do was to open the checkbook and write more checks because it wasn't his money. That was the difference. Hmm. Well, let me ask you this then. We mentioned that WCW was obviously an unprofessional place to work at that point in time, and you were with WCW. I read in a recent interview through the end, but... You were pretty much um, unseen and unheard it's from late 99 until the end. I really didn't even know if you were still part of the company. And the only time that I ever heard you mention was when Vince Russo was taking personal shots at you, calling you one of the quote-unquote good old boys on the TV. What do you think of Vince Russo, and were you uh, at all bothered by his philosophy on wrestling? Well, if you read Wrestlers Are Like Seagulls, you will find that I am very open and honest about everybody that I encountered in, like I say, 40-some years of wrestling. And my feeling was always if you don't have something good to say about someone, you know, Ken, try not to say anything at all. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very open about the strengths and weaknesses of, uh, of just about everybody that I work with throughout my entire career. And I, if, you're willing to, to, if you're going to do that, I think you have to be willing to look in the mirror and do it with yourself, too. And I, I feel that I um, had an honest assessment of what I feel my strong points are and where some of my weaknesses are. But there are only three people in the whole book that I really don't have much time for. One was Brad Siegel, who was in charge of WCW at the time. The jerk that sold the company. <laughs> Eric Bischoff and Vince Russo. And I, I don't blame Eric Bischoff for taking an opportunity and running with it, but I blame him for not being very smart and not a good businessman and basically running running it into the ground, and Vince Russo was just a pawn that uh, helped facilitate it faster than it probably would have otherwise, and, and really the most blame I put on Brad Siegel because Brad was paid the big bucks. He was the, 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 the golden boy there for a while that uh, uh, was held in high esteem by Ted Turner himself, and when you're at that level, 
you are supposed to be able to read people, read situations, and I know from firsthand knowledge that he was told the direction that the company was going and what the consequences were going to be, and he knew already the damage that Eric Bischoff had done. He was shown that even though Vince Rousseau was hired with good intentions and given an opportunity to fail or succeed, it became very obvious that he was taking the company down a path of destruction. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, Brad Siegel was confronted and said, look, you, you need to cut your loss right here and go another direction or your company's not going to survive. And he turned a deaf ear and after a short period of time actually brought uh, Bischoff and Russo back uh, as a combination. And as a result, uh, I was under contract at the time, so I continued to be paid. But for the last year or so, I sat in an office every day and waited for that knock on the door from Brad Siegel to say, you know, he didn't have to say, hey, you were right. But, you know, I, I didn't, that wasn't really what I was waiting for. But I was waiting for somebody to knock on the door and say, hey, we're in big trouble. And you've been in the business all these years. You worked for Vince McMahon, our main competitor. Give me some insight. Give me some, you know, open up to me. Tell me what we got to do. And the knock never came on the door. And the next thing you know, the, the losses were horrific. Uh, you, know, you talk about losing... At one point, it was reported that they were losing $80 million and projected to lose probably as much going forward. And when they cut everywhere that they could possibly cut, they couldn't get below, I think the number I heard was $62 million with another 60 some projected losses. And AOL Time Warner, with all the mergers, uh, was more willing to take a one-time write-off of that huge loss and uh, you know, like something that's smelling in a garbage can, you know, just flip the lid on it and throw it out and hope you don't have to smell it anymore. <laughs> wow. Well, once again, the book is titled, what again? You can you can go and buy this book at J.J. Dillon. Listeners are like seagulls. Go to jjdillon.com. Uh, it's been out since uh, June. Uh, and we've done excellent uh, with mail order sales, which right now is the only way you can get it. And hopefully someday it may be on Amazon.com or it may be on bookstores, but it's a hardbound book. Uh, I guarantee you that if you get it, you, you won't be disappointed. And please take the time to read the reviews and comments before you decide whether to get it or not. And I think uh, you'll see that almost across the board, everybody that's uh, gotten the book and read it has been uh, pleased. And everybody, you know, sees something different that they like about it. But across the board, everybody likes it. Mm. And we're selling copies in Japan and Australia and New Zealand and all throughout Europe as well as all across the United States. So uh, it's a word-of-mouth thing, and I appreciate, uh, James and Chuck, that you've let me on Wrestling Epicenter today. And uh, anybody within earshot here of uh, Blaze 1260 here in Tempe, uh, if you've got a friend, pick up the phone or get on the Internet and tell them, hey, I heard J.J. Dillon, and he said go to jjdillon.com and, uh, hey, check out Wrestlers Like Seagulls. We won't be disappointed. Well, you made a great case for him, and you've had some excellent stories to share with us here today. All right. Thank you so much for your time, sir. We wish you the best of luck in the future. And once again, if you if that ever does get promoted on Amazon or anything like that, be sure to pop on. Uh, we won't keep you as long as we kept you today, and we can just say, hey, go buy it now. You can get it at any bookstore. Guys, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank okay, you, sir. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye. Hello? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. We uh, got that. Thank you. That will probably air this Wednesday. And once again, thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate it. I've enjoyed it. You guys are obviously very well informed, and you asked some great questions. And uh, again, I, you know, a self-published effort. You, you have to look anywhere and everywhere for anybody that's willing to uh, talk wrestling and mention that you have a book, and that's how the word spreads. And, Definitely. And uh, I, I really greatly appreciate this time and the help you give me. Thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us for so long. We know we took a little longer than you probably expected. <laughs> oh, that's quite all right. All right, take it easy, man. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye. Worker of the week. John Cena. Hey, this is Batista, World Heavyweight Champion, and you're listening to Blaze 1260 AM.
Sorry we had to cut that one a little short here on the Blaze 1260 AM. If you want to hear the entire interview, and I suggest you should, check it out at www.wrestlingepicenter.com. Should be up first thing tomorrow morning, but I want to remind everybody, before we head on out of here in less than 10 minutes, I want you all, everybody in this audience is a wrestling fan. It is your duty as a wrestling fan to tune in this Saturday night to TNA on Spike TV. Got to do it. You got to do it. If not, I don't want to hear you. I don't want you listening next week if you've not listened. If you've not watched, I won't TNA. go that far. But I'll I will. I don't want you complaining about the WWE if you didn't bother to tune into TNA. It's like people that are stuck on a desert island, and a great steak dinner oh, washes yeah, up. That's great. You know what? Just stop talking now. <laughs> so what, what is it, Patrickless? We got you on the phone, right, buddy? Yo, what's up, Chuck? Hey, we got Patrick Liss of the Weekend Warriors of Wrestling joining us here. We're going to talk a little bit of TNA now, as you couldn't already guess that one. And by, <laughs> by the way, if, if, for the <laughs> Dude, are you drinking? Have, have you been drinking? <laughs> this no. is ridiculous. <laughs> for those of us up there. Hey, there's a lot of going on in TNA right now. They ah. just announced that Bound for Glory, we're going to have Kevin Nash versus Jeff Jarrett, which in my opinion is not the smartest of ideas. Why do you have to have Kevin Nash in the ring at all for TNA? Why do you even have to have him there? It's a waste of time. He's facing Jeff Jarrett. He's a big Jeff star. Jarrett. He's recognizable, and their first match was good. I yeah, agree. He's not that big of a star. He was a big star six, five, six years ago. His time is coming on. This guy pair. would pull a hamstring trying to answer the phone. I've said it time and time again. Out of all the big names that are available out there, Sting, Bret Hart, even though Bret Hart's not going to wrestle, to have him there would be phenomenal. Goldberg, all these people come in and make far more of an impact than Kevin Nash. Even worse, they sign this guy to a year-long contract. I I'm not trying to watch Kevin Nash on TNA. I want to watch good wrestling. Good wrestling does not equal Kevin Nash. They're opposites. Yeah, but then you bitch about good wrestling brought to us by people like Samoa Joe. And by the way, what I was trying to say before is for those of us on planet Earth, he's Patrick, not Patrickless. Nevertheless, <laughs> I'm telling you this. I never once doubted Samoa Joe's wrestling ability. I doubted his ability to draw and then pushing him. Which, well, if Kevin you Nash can't wrestle, but he sure can draw. what's going on, you would have known that. Kevin Nash can't wrestle, but he sure can draw. Yeah, we heard you. You were already talking over me the first time you said that. Mm-hmm. Well, you tend oh, to he's the most you. recognizable guy they have right now, so why not push him? I, I tend to disagree with that. I think there could be far... Uh, Samoa Joe? You're telling me is Kevin the Nash. most recognizable... No, Kevin Nash! Oh. How recognizable is he? Stay with the program here, dude. I don't believe Kevin Nash to be what that recognizable. Compared to everybody else in the TNA roster right now... He's the most recognizable guy, so it makes sense to me that he would be in the main event. I agree. How can you say he's that recognizable? This guy's been off TV for over, what, a year now? I don't oh, have a problem. Four months, but... <laughs> yeah, well, he means WWE TV, but the bottom line oh, is, yeah. dude, you, people remember who the stars are. People remember Big Daddy Cool from WWF. People remember... Did I say WWF? Wow. People remember Kevin Nash from WCW as a member of the NWL. People are not stupid. They know who's a star and who's not a star, and this guy is a star. Yeah, like this guy is a star. Let me tell you a little secret about stars, baby. They all burn out. Kevin Nash, a star, burned out five years ago, like I said. He should have quit after WCW. I don't know why he went to the WWE, and I do not know why TNA is wasting their money on this guy. There's so many other people out there. Like, you know, I'd rather get... Ten superstars, which what they could get for the price that I'm sure they paid for Kevin Nash, and you'd be bitching about who they were. I, dude, you can't. You are so ridiculously silly to me, dude. You're saying because I said don't push Samoa Joe as your top guy, that means I don't like anyone they have. Okay. I would push the crap okay, out here. of Monty Brown. I'd push the crap out of Abyss. I'd push the crap out of Lance Hoyt. I'd push the crap out of AJ Styles. Okay. I'd push the crap out of every single one of those guys. And you know what I'd do? I'd give Kevin Nash a grocery bag, and I'd say, get your crap and get out of my company. Let's Period. sign. Let's sign. Gail right, Kim. but Monty Brown, he's been damaged big time since that heel turn that turned out to be a disaster. They well, need to rebuild him all over. Then let's start doing it. Let's not waste yeah, any more time. I'll tell you what, Chuck. I'll tell you what, Chuck. Let's sign. Right away. Let's sign Molly Holly. Let's sign Gail Kim. Let's sign Austin Aries. Let's sign uh, who else? They sign uh, Alex Shelley. Let's sign all these guys. And what are you going to be saying? Why do they not have any stars? That's hysterical, dude. I didn't bring up one of those people's names. I'm pretty sure the you people I've named are established ago. stars. 
um, within the TNA roster that they should be building. They need to build from within. They don't need to bring people who are going to get no real reaction. What like I said on PW Insider. I, I don't even know what you're doing. Man. When I <laughs> like I said on PW Insider's hotline, it takes a star to make a star. Unfortunately, Chris Sabin against AJ Styles is not going to propel either one of them. Chris Sabin against Kevin Nash will. Yeah, if they could just build up Monty Brown or anyone credible, I could even see Lance Hoyt being a champion there. If they'd spent the time to build them up, they don't need to bring in some has-been star in order to get their other stars over. It's absolutely stupid. It's a waste of time. You have to bring in stars that can actually bring something unique and to the And you mean product. to tell me that Kevin Nash is the only star they can bring in that would bring something unique to the product? It's Out of all the stars to bring in, you would choose Kevin Nash. He would be on my top ten list, yes. He wouldn't be on my top 100. Well, then you, my friend, are an idiot. I'd rather bring in Charlie Haas. I'd rather oh, yeah, bring in a Molly Holly. Oh, no. I'd rather no. bring in... Oh, take it or leave it. You don't like it, I'm telling you the truth here. At least Charlie Harley, uh, Charlie, Charlie Haas... Harley. Charlie Haas is someone that you can build a company Charlie's on for 15, gimmick. 20 no, they're years they're down the road. No, they're trying to make an impact. What does the difference Charlie. mean? You're going to bring in this guy, he's going to get injured, and you just wasted a year's worth of money on a nobody. But nobody knows who he is. He was on WWE TV last year. He was not on WWE TV last year. Ke uh, Charlie Haas? Yes, he was. Uh, well, I, I don't know he who you're talking WWE about. TV because you know what? Down. You can't understand the words that come out of your mouth when you try and use some pseudo gimmick that doesn't even work. The when bottom you're line like is this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> where's the warrior when you need him? Well, dude, listen. Charlie Haas may be more fresh on people's minds, but he was not legitimate. Listen. Kevin Nash was never anything but a main eventer. And the bottom line is people remember that. So Kevin me. Nash was nothing but a main was eventer. Was Charlie Haas even on TV? The last Are you sure you want to stick by that statement that Kevin Nash was nothing but... A main eventer. Since 1994, yeah, I'll stick by that. Oh, okay. Now we're now we're just gonna set rules and regulations. Big Daddy Cole Diesel was the world well, champion. Well, he was WWF champion for a year. Uh, he was WWF. I can just remember him being a bodyguard of Shawn Michaels when he wasn't a main eventer. Yeah, that was. So he wasn't yeah, always he was a main eventer. That was 12 years ago. Oh, well, I'm just saying, you should probably clarify what you're saying, because people would say, oh, well, I don't recall him always being It was like three nights after Survivor Series, he won the world title it's in just 1994. So silly you know, if I was going to waste that kind of money, I'd at least bring in someone like a Goldberg who isn't totally damaged. Kevin Nash has no credibility left. The I guy know. hobbles around. Oh, come on. He does not hobble around. That's such an internet mark statement. If you ever <laughs> watch the guy in the ring, he's actually fairly fluent. Fairly fluent? Fairly fluid. I've Why? Because you can do a, a jackknife? Because he can do a big boot. Can you do a big boot? Yeah, so right, about Chuck. everyone else in wrestling. Chuck, let me ask you this question. I'm going to stand here right now in front of your face. If you can get your foot up to my face, you have permission to kick me in the mouth. Go. Uh, are you sure you want to try this? Yeah, go for it, dude. All right. L well, come here. I no, thought you were going to get right in my face. <laughs> Look, I'll even do it right now. Here we go. Ready? Go. My foot wow. is now up. Past his face, ready? Oh, <laughs> up above his head, it just went right there, ladies and gentlemen, on the radio. So let's height. talk a little bit more Show about their height, TNA right way. here. Show okay, their there's a lot of other good things that they're doing, valuable things. Like I said, they were smart enough to come up with the idea with a 30 man or, or 30 minute, excuse me, Iron Man match, which WWE promptly ripped off. This is going to be worth the price of admission. Let me tell you what: Christopher Daniels, AJ Styles, 30 minutes. It's going to be hyped up. This is a match I'm looking forward to see. Bound for Glory, man. It's going to be off the chain. Did you see the first one? I, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tremendous. I, I expect this one to be very good as well. I, I would expect it to even be better because they have that much more seasoning and experience behind them. They know each other that much better. Man, I, I would expect this nothing to, to be but a five-star classic. Five. Anything I, else I, would I be disappointing to me. I, I would agree with that. If it's anything but a five-star classic, it's going to be a disappointment. Which I, I think it will deliver on. Oh, it will deliver. What else well, you got to say about TNA, uh, Mr. I, Walsh? I'll try not to set my hopes too high. See, Mr. So. Walsh really wanted to, to take time and discuss TNA. Right. Now he's not saying anything. What, what, what else do you want to talk say? about? I'd like to say that I think you're wrong about the stars they brought in. However, I will say this. They need to bring more people in for Bound for Glory, and the bottom line These is... These stars. I'm only talking about one star, so let's, well, let's get this correct. you're complaining about everybody. Samoa Joe they brought in recently. You don't like him. You don't li you're not going to like Austin Aries. You still don't listen in. to what I say, do you? You don't like Juice and Thunder Liger. You see, you shouldn't talk before you listen is the problem I'm having here. I like Samoa Joe. He works great matches. He should not be every press release you put out leading up to your TV debut. It is ridiculous. 
No one is going to tune in to their Spike TV debut to hear Samoa Joe. I'll tell you what they will. It's ridiculous. In, They'll tune All in the commercials I see, they have uh, AJ, Monty, uh, Jeff Jarrett, and Jeff Hardy. I'm not right. talking about their commercials. Every press release, you can go to WrestlingUpCenter.com, look at the news archives. Every press release, they talk about Samoa Joe. And I said, listen, if they want to make an impact, Samoa Joe's not going to be the guy to do it with. Can either the two of you legitimately argue with me in a meaningful way that Samoa Joe is actually going to be a huge impact for TNA when they join Spike TV. Because I don't buy it. I cannot buy that. Right I right. do not buy it. Right but right I will right say now. this. Kevin Nash will be. And Chuck is standing there stunned. Kevin Nash <laughs> will be a big part of TNA if he stays healthy, and I think he will. He will be a huge part of TNA, and I think you're cutting them a little. You gotta cut them a little slack here, dude. This is their first show on Spike TV. I have not read the spoilers. I'm telling you this though. Leading into Bound for Glory, you're gonna see another star pop up. Who it'll be, I don't know. How am I not cutting them slack? I'm like, hey, this Iron Man match off the chain. I gave them so much credit, it, and even the fact that WWE acknowledged that they were doing it gives them that much more credit. I'm just simply saying. Do you set up your TV debut around Samoa Joe and Justin Thunder Clown? No. Do you set up your whole promotion around a 50-year-old man who is basically crippled from the waist down? No. That's all I've ever said. Everything else they do, I enjoy. Okay? Okay. So you can go ahead and make your generalizations that are highly inaccurate to make yourself sound like you know what you're talking about, when Rudy. in reality, you're not even listening to the words that are coming out of my mouth. Rudy, you, you understand the about. words that are coming out of my mouth? To say that, that it is a good idea to use Samoa Joe is like one of your top stars I'm not is saying ridiculous. that. I'm Just saying it hurts my head to even hear you people argue this with Why me. are we still talking about Samoa Joe? Because that's all you can bring up, because you I know what? I'm talking about Kevin Nash! Why don't you talk about something different here in the 30 seconds we have? I kept talking uh, about Kevin Nash. You keep talking about Samoa Joe. Get on the same Because I already page, talked pal. about Kevin Nash. Well, that was the first thing we talked about. You yeah, get on the same you page. You want to bring Bret Hart. And I already said he sucked. You want to bring Bret Hart into not wrestling. Here, let me put it for good you again. Good idea, dude. Kevin Nash is a waste for TNA. Next segment, Samoa Joe, you cannot build a company around. Next segment, go ahead. What do you mean my next segment? Go ahead. I have 30 seconds. We don't have another segment, idiot. So you have nothing else to say about TNA. Oh. Well, I have more to say about TNA. I have TNA. this to say. This oh, time. now you have something to say. Congratulations. I have this to say about TNA. Once again, it is your duty as a wrestling fan to watch the show on Saturday night. And you it have is. to tune in next week because guess what, dude? I have a little surprise to spring on you right here, right now. Guess who our guest is, guest is next week on the wrestling episode? Well, let me have it, baby. The man you just spent the last 15 minutes making fun of. Next week on this show, Samoa Joe. Good. I already know that. What do you think of that? I think it's inaccurate because he's actually not joining us next Saturday. Next Wednesday? No, actually, he's not. Who said that? Uh, we're actually getting Shark Boy instead. Who said this? <laughs> uh, the representative from TNA. Wow. But thanks for playing along, James Walsh. It's been great having you. Uh, <laughs> Why do I feel like I just lost in The Price is Right? <laughs> Bob Barker just took a dump on your face. I keep thinking about that, that little guy climbing the mountain, yolo dee dee, and it falls off at the top. Yeah, you dude, you're like in the Plinko game, and you just landed on zero every time. <laughs> Bob Barker just, like, raped you. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you bend down to play golf in front of him. What the hell are you people <laughs> talking about? See, he doesn't even make any sense. He tries to be funny. Everyone knows what Plinko <laughs> is, right? You put Wait, the little chip. He plays, he plays the little... Pachinko. Um, is yeah. it Pachinko? No, it's Plinko. Uh, but no one knows what you're talking about anyway, guys. He tries the little, the little miniature golf challenge, and he oh, tries to golf. We are so out of time. We might have to do an internet show this week. We said this last week. We have still so much to talk about. And man. then he sexually well, molested his for. interns. Say what? That's what Eric and I are for. We're the internet show. I think we might have to do one ourselves. James Walsh and I have too much. We're not getting through everything. Ah. That's what the hotline oh. is for. Though I think we need more than that, even. Dude, you want to talk a lot about wrestling. For a guy who claims to not like it, you certainly like to talk about it. No, I just need to get through everything. <laughs> I can't get through everything. Because I've sit here and listened to you two Nimrods tell me about how great Samoa Joe is. I never I said he was Samoa great. Joe. I, oh, I whatever, never guys. once said he was great. Hey, we are all out of time here. You've listened to the wrestling episode. And we'd like to thank J.J. Dillon, Francine, as well as uh, Mr. Michael Moody for swinging by our show this week. Uh, we'll have someone from TNA you know next week guy? on. 
I'll tell you what, it's going to be a good show. You know that, so, Michael? Uh, make sure you keep it locked right here to ASU's original alternative, The Blaze, 1260 AM. You are ignoring me.